Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for your patience. We had to move from the other room uh, due to the fact that we had so many people coming and happy to see the level of interest that we're seeing uh, today. Let me just say right off the bat that we've been joined uh, by Council Member uh, Perkins uh, here today and also um, joined by our Legislative Council, Joshua Kinsley, our senior analyst, Willie Honkach, and uh, my director of legislation, Claire McClavin. And so with that, let me just get started here. Good afternoon. I am Council Member Fernando Cabrera, and I'm chair of the Juvenile Justice Committee. During today's oversight hearing, we will be examining DYFJ's efforts in the implementation of raising the age of criminal responsibility. I want to thank you all who are here today to discuss this important topic concerning our city's court-involved youth. Before I begin to discuss today's topic, I want to express what a privilege it has been to serve the people of this great city as chair of the Juvenile Justice Committee for the past four years. I don't know if I'll be chair of this committee uh, coming back in January. Nobody knows what they will be chairing, but it's been a pleasure uh, to, to serve in this capacity. I firmly believe that this committee has purview over one of the city's most important responsibilities, and that is providing care for our core involved youth, many of whom come from a disadvantaged setting. It is up to us collectively to help address the needs of this population and to give them a better chance at becoming positive contributors to society. Raising the age of criminal responsibility is paramount to providing 16 and 17 year olds with exposure to therapeutic services, which would otherwise not be an option in the criminal justice system. This committee has examined raising the age of criminality both directly and indirectly for many years. Our most recent hearing on raising the age was this past January. That hearing, the committee examined how youth will be better served if provided options to address problems and underlying causes of behavior issues rather than being exposed to the criminal justice system. Since the hearing in January, the New York State, New York State passed legislation, legislation to raise the age of criminal responsibility to 18 and finally recognized that sending a youth person to family court presents off ramps for youth where they may be connected to programs and services focusing on re rehabilitation, supervision, mental health treatment, and education. This helps create the opportunity to change the course of a young person's life forever, an opportunity that will most likely not be available if youth were in the criminal justice system. It is with great pleasure to discuss with you today how New York City plans to implement raising the age of criminal responsibility and how the city plans to house and provide services to this population. We hope to hear from the administration on the planning and the progress that has been undertaken to facilitate the successful implementation of the state's race the age legislation. Specifically, the committee seeks, to, seeks information on planning for retrofitting of juvenile facilities by October 1st, 2018 to enable the housing of 16 and 17 year olds required to be moved off Rikers Island back that day. Additionally, the committee seeks further details on DYFJ plans for staffing increases that may be, let me change that, that will be necessary to accommodate increases in the juvenile population in its custody. Furthermore, aside from the logistic implementation of raising the age of criminal responsibility, the committee wants to fully understand how raising the age will create positive impacts and opportunities for not only court involved you, but also society. Again, in conclusion, I want to thank uh, my staff for helping uh, put together this hearing. We look forward to hearing testimony from representatives of the administration, as well as union and advocates and nonprofits that have signed up uh, to testify. I will now kindly ask for representative of the administration to please state their name for the record so that the committee council can administer the oath. Dana Kaplan with the Mayor's Office of Criminal Justice. 
Felipe Franco with ACS. Anna Marzullo with DOC. Nicole Torres with the Mayor's Office of Criminal Justice. Uh, do you firm to tell the truth, the whole truth, nothing but the truth in your testimony before this committee and to respond honestly to council member questions? Yes. 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 You may begin. Great. Good afternoon, Chair Cabrera and members of the Committee on Juvenile Justice. My name is, as I just said, Dana Kaplan, and I'm the Executive Director of Youth and Strategic Initiatives at the Mayor's Office of Criminal Justice. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today. I'm joined by uh, colleagues from ACS, DOC, and the Mayor's Office of Criminal Justice to assist with answering all questions. Um, and I just want to start by echoing the excitement about being here to testify about the implementation progress in Raise the Age. This is obviously a law that is overdue and that the administration supported, that there was many people in this room who uh, worked very hard to get passed, that had support from the council uh, in Albany, and it's certainly a great opportunity for the city, and we are looking at it as such. The Mayor's Office of Criminal Justice advises the Mayor on public safety strategy and, together with partners inside and outside of government, develops and implements policies that reduce crime, reduce unnecessary incarceration, promote fairness, and build strong and safe neighborhoods. The topic of today's hearing, the City's plans to implement Raise the Age, can be seen in a larger context. In the last four years in New York City, we've seen an acceleration of the trends that have defined the public safety landscape in the City over the last three decades. While jail and prison populations around the country increased, New York City's jail population has fallen by half since 1990. And in the last four years, the jail population dropped by 20%, giving us the lowest incarceration rate of any big city and the steepest four-year decline in the size of the jail population since 1998. Since 2014 in particular, the number of 16 and 17-year-olds in custody and the number of youth in secure juvenile detention have both dropped significantly about 60% each, from 409 to 143 adolescents in DOC facilities and uh, an average daily population most recently in ACS of 150 to 58. This is even as our crime rate has continued its downward trend. Last year was the safest year in Comstat history and low level enforcement has also reduced dramatically. This is unique proof that jurisdictions can have more safety in smaller jails, and it is upon this progress that we are currently building. Mayor de Blasio and the leadership of our Administration for Children's Services, the New York City Police Department, Department of Correction, Department of Probation, Educa Education, and the Law Department have repeatedly affirmed the city's support for raising the age of criminal responsibility prior to its passage. Additionally, Elizabeth Glazer, the director of my office, participated in the Governor's Commission and was integral in developing the initial proposal for Raise the Age in 2015. Since passage of, in April of this year, the City has been working intensively to prepare for implementation. We have formed working groups focused on court processing, programming and diversion, data analytics and facilities, with participation from the courts, district attorneys, public defenders and all City agencies responsible for implementation. We have begun engaging with our nonprofit partners and providers to prepare for implementation and have brought in local and national technical assistance to assist our efforts. New York City has been aggressively focused on preparing for the opportunity that Raise the Age presents to build on past reforms and develop a best-in-class juvenile justice system while continuing to deliver better outcomes for youth and public safety. And in, per in particular, and specific to the topic of this particular hearing, City agencies have been working intensively to ensure we meet the statutory time frame required while providing age-appropriate housing, services, and programs and facilities that are safe for both juveniles and staff. We believe the City can meet the ambitious deadline for moving juveniles off of Rikers Island, but meeting that deadline and the law's objectives will require specific assistance from the State. As we have shared with the State, the City's plan for creating the specialized secure detention facilities required under Raise the Age and the assistance requested to ensure the goals of the statute are met are as follows. One, we plan to renovate the City's two existing secure juvenile detention facilities. The City plans to renovate Crossroads located in Brownsville and Horizon in Mott Haven to maximize their operational capacity, enhance programmatic, recreational, and educational space and ensure needed health and safety improvements are made to these two facilities. 
The city is already underway with $55 million of planned renovations at these two sites. Two, we plan to obtain the licensure from the state required by the statute to operate Crossroads and Horizon as both specialized secure detention facilities and secure juvenile detention facilities. After full implementation of Raise the Age, the term juvenile delinquents or JDs will refer to youth 7 to 17 who have been charged with misdemeanor and or low-level felony charges. Juvenile offenders or JOs will refer to youth ages 13 to 15 who have been charged with violent felony charges. And a newly created category of adolescent offenders will refer to 16 to 17 year olds with felony charges that remain in the newly created youth parts of adult criminal court. Dual licensure will provide the city with the flexibility to house JDs, JOs, and the newly created category of AOs in these facilities. In a provision unique to New York City, we are also required to move off island to all individuals who on October 1st, 2018 are 16 or 17 and on Rikers Island. We would anticipate that we would also use the specialized secure detention facilities to house this category of young people. Because age and security classifications may not correlate exactly to the juvenile status within the courts as JDs, JOs, or AOs, we request that commingling restrictions within housing, education, recreation, and programming be determined by the city's classification system rather than their court status alone. The city's classification systems are currently in development for finalization by the Raise the Age implementation deadline. And to be very clear, flexibility does not mean that we will commingle youth in a manner that compromises safety in any way or the ability to deliver effective programming. It allows us to make those determinations based off of a targeted assessment of individualized needs and risks. Three, we seek to partner with the state to develop an additional facility to ha act as an intake and reception center for the JD, JO, and AO population. This intake facility will provide sufficient capacity for the city's projected population of juveniles in detention post Raise the Age implementation, which we assume will be consistent with the current practice, and minimize the impacts of incarceration on young people who will be released within less than a week which comprise a significant percentage, 63% and 46 respectively, of the current ACS and DOC populations. The city will seek licensure from the state to operate the, in the intake facility as both an SSD for the AO population and a secure detention facility for those under 16. Our standing request to the state is to partner to convert the Office of Children and Family Services Reception Center, Ella McQueen, for use as the city's intake center. Ella McQueen, which does not currently serve young people from New York City as a function of the passage of Close to Home, is the only facility identified that would both meet the objectives of Raise the Age to provide safe and supportive juvenile detention facilities for uh, juveniles and staff, and if provided to the city, would not be subject to the city's uniform land use uh, review procedure, which would delay the city's compliance with, the raise, with raise the Age. As you know, under the New York City Charter, a site that has not pre previously been used in a manner comparable to its proposed use and will require extensive capital construction or renovation is subject to ULERP, a process which takes approximately 10 to 12 months to complete whether or not there is significant public support. This is significant because construction could not begin until ULERP is completed, and because of this reality, the city can only use a facility that will not trigger this um, if it is to meet the October 1, 2018 deadline. We are committed to funding diversion programs to ensure that detention of adolescents is used only when appropriate and for the least amount of time possible. The city is investing in case expediting supports and a second look program to decrease the amount of time that young people spend on Rikers Island and identify adolescents who may be eligible for release to community-based supervision. Expanded supervised release for young adults and other interventions to target JDs, JOs, AOs, and the population of young people currently in detention on Rikers Island. New York City's reforms aimed at safely reducing the number of detained young people have already been very successful. As I mentioned, um, the average daily jail population this calendar year of 143 to date in custody of DOC and 58 in ACS secure detention. But as we prepare for implementation, we are expanding our efforts and have partnered with the Annie E. Casey Foundation to provide additional technical assistance to support this important work. As we develop the necessary detention capacity for Raise the Age, we are also focused on ensuring that deten detention is used judiciously, only as appropriate, and for as limited a period of time as possible. 
Our implementation efforts are centered on building off of past supports and investments for community-based interventions and identifying where we can be doing more to fill needed gaps in the continuum, particularly at the neighborhood level. We plan to implement a, plan, a, phase, a planned phasing of primary responsibility for oversight of adolescent offenders and the Rikers 16 and 17 year old population from DOC to ACS. Raise the Age contemplates joint operation of the specialized secure detention facilities by, AO, by ACS and DOC, but the law itself does not specify how this is to work in practice. ACS has agreed to assume responsibility for the delivery of medical and case management services as well as recreational programming within the SSD facilities. With respect to security, ACS does not currently have sufficient staffing capacity to manage this expanded population of older youth who will be housed in these detention facilities post raise the age. And as such, this process will begin with DOC initially having primary responsibility for managing specifically the AO population as well as those adolescents moved off of Rikers Island. As ACS develops its staffing capacity to assume direct supervision of the AO population, uh, DOC will transition to an advisory role with the option to retain some operational responsibilities. We anticipate this timeline will take 24 months, but we want to underscore that ACS and DOC staff are working together to, de to develop a shared vision of facility operation consistent with the juvenile model and principles of adolescent development to ensure consistency of operations during this period of transition and that we open the facilities with the model that we seek to achieve long term. As outlined above, New York City has an aggressive plan for meeting the requirements of Raise the Age that matches our commitment to ensuring that young people in New York City receive the benefits of this important piece of legislation. As stated in our communications with various state officials over the last several months, in order to meet the requirement that we move the current juvenile population off of Rikers Island and into a specialized secure detention facility a year earlier than a full transition is required for the rest of the state, we are seeking the state's partnership and assistance. Specifically, what we have requested from the state to ensure compliance is one, before the end of this year, draft re regulations from SCOC and OCFS that will govern the specialized secure detention facilities. We are making necessary physical re uh, renovations, staffing, programming, and operational plans to allow DOC and ACS to jointly operate these specialized secure detention facilities and jointly planning operations based off of best practices in adolescent development. In absence of the regulations from the state, we can't be certain that certain investments in physical infrastructure and planning will comply, particularly in light with some inconsistencies between the two sets of regulatory pro provisions. To the extent that the state, will the state regulations may require modifications to existing plans, the city agencies will need ample time and flexibility to respond effectively. In addition to review of the new regulations before 2018, we also request and have requested flexibility from the state oversight agencies in the early stages of implementation, including potentially a mechanism for obtaining waivers when appropriate. We are requesting expedited approval from OCFS and SCOC for licensure of Crossroads Horizons and the intake facility. Given the 18 month timeline in which New York City has to plan, renovate and operationalize facilities, we request that the uh, regulatory agencies put into place an expedited approval process to significantly reduce the timeline typical for licensure of a facility following renovations, which can be up to two to three months. We request approval for commingling populations when safe and appropriate. ADs, AOs, JDs, and JOs are classified based on charge, court, age, charge, and court process, family versus criminal court. However, given other considerations related to security and the appropriate and efficient provisions of services and aid programs, the city has requested approval to commingle young people on the basis of a classification system that takes into consideration all of the relevant factors, including age and consideration of risk. This will avoid needless inefficiencies that, be, that could be created through strict prohibitions in, against commingling based on court categorization alone and allow the flexibility to mix populations in the safest and most effective way. The city has identified an expert on adolescent classification that is working with the agencies to finalize an age appropriate classification system that will be ready by the raise the age implementation deadline. We're seeking and we require approval to use Ella McQueen as an intake facility to ensure that the city has sufficient capacity to appropriately house all juveniles in detention. 
We have a pending request to use Ella McQueen as an intake facility through either the license or lease of the facility to the city for its use. Given that this facility is no longer serving a New York City young, uh, youth population, we would appreciate the use of this facility long term, but at a, minimum, at a minimum, have requested the opportunity to use this facility as a stopgap measure until additional capacity can be developed in an alternative site. If the state is amenable to providing this needed support, we would ask for expeditious approval for city agency staff and a design team to tour the facility before the end of the year. We've requested state funding to support New York City's plan to rapidly implement Raise the Age. Uh, the city requests that the state maintain its long-standing commitment to finance a portion of the cost for detention, placement, and alternative programs that both the state and city recognize as crucial to the rehabilitation and reentry of youth into their communities. As a provider for the largest population of juveniles in the state and with a tight implementation timeline, the city would like to be considered for any new funding streams that may be created related to the implementation. Additionally, we ask for a consideration for an increase of current block grants used to fund detention placement and the city's supervision and treatment services for juvenile programs allocations. And finally, the city will once again pursue design build legislation at the state level, a streamlined process of procuring design and construction together both for the development of specialized secure detention facilities and any other capital projects required for Raise the Age implementation, such that any necessary construction projects are completed in the shortest time frame possible and not impede timely implementation of Raise the Age across the board. In closing, New York City has long supported reforms that treat 16 and 17 year olds as juveniles in order to produce the best possible outcomes for young people, their families, and for public safety. We are very optimistic about the implementation of Raise the Age and believe that we are well poised to build on the significant progress that we have made to date in New York City's juvenile and young adult justice systems for the benefit of our city's children, families, and for public safety. Yet we also acknowledge that successful implementation of this important reform requires a great deal of effort and coordination between city agencies, the courts, prosecutors, defenders, community and neighborhood providers, and between the state and local government. We are committed to doing our part to make this a success, and we are hopeful that with that cooperation between the city, the state, and all stakeholders, we can jointly realize the goals of Raise the Age on the timeline set forth by the law. Thank you for the opportunity to testify here today on what we believe is an incredibly important issue. And uh, following the testimony of my colleague, I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Dana. Um, before I begin, on a personal note, for the last 15 years, um, almost on a yearly basis, um, first at the state OCFS, now in New York City, uh, the, the Division of Youth and Family Justice, we have actually seen many of the folks here in the room go to Albany and advocate on behalf of Raise the Age. Um, it has taken a long time, but it's, I'm glad to be able here to finally talk about the plans for ACS to meet this mandate, but more than anything, this opportunity. Thank you. First, ACS firmly believes that all our youth belong in age and developmentally appropriate settings that are tailored to meet the, their specific needs and maximize their potential as productive adults. Tre treating children as adults does not promote, treating children as adults does not promote the long-term goals of rehabilitation, which makes our city safe. This is why the city advocated in Albany for policy changes, and we are delighted that New York State will now treat young people as young, peop young, people, as young people in the ju juvenile justice system. We look forward to working with our partners to expand our quality programming and services to 16 and 17 year olds, who no doubt will benefit from the, from, from the more therapeutic interventions. This includes broadening our array of early interventions and alternative to community-based programs such as alternative to detention and placement to keep youth accountable as well as promoting evidence-based models and treatment within our detention and placement facilities that meet the developmental needs of older adolescents. Our work at the Division of Youth and Family Justice is focused on helping the youth we serve develop the skills and abilities to control and manage their emotions and behavior with the innovative work that ACS has undertaken to build the juvenile justice system that promotes positive youth development. We join, we join the major city, the city council, our partner city agencies in embracing Raise the Age as a critical and long overdue reform. As you have already heard from Dana Kaplan, 
from the Mayor's Office of Criminal Justice, ACS is one of many agencies working in partnership with our MOCJ to plan the implementation of the initial requirements of race to age legislation by October 1, 2018. A citywide steering committee shared by the MOCJ has been meeting to guide the overall citywide planning effort, and it includes representatives for multiple agencies, including ACS, NYPD, Department of Corrections, Department of Probations, the Department of Design and Construction, the Department of Education, and the Office of Management and Budget, and the Law Department, as well as the State Office of Court Administrations. Uh, we welcome the opportunity moving forward to in include others, in meaning, including the City Council. This steering committee oversees the four working groups who meet regularly and are each responsible for planning around a specific, a specific critical issues, including court process, programming and diversion, data analytics, analytics and risk assessment and facilities. In addition to our involvement in, on the citywide steering committee and our participation in various working groups, SES convenes weekly and internal meetings with key divisions and program areas to identify and plan for SES specific implementation actions. We have embraced the opportunity to conceptualize alternatives to detention and placement that are age appropriate and gender responsive to meet the needs of all children in the human justice system and that address the current, the current gaps for youth without a permanency resource. We have also been working closely with our partners at the Department of Education to plan for enhanced career and technical education programming for youth in detention and in close to home. Have you heard in the previous testimony, most of the city planning hinges on the clarification from the state oversight body, bodies, including OCFS and the State Commission on Correction, on the regulations that will apply to programs for this population of young people. We look forward from receiving from the state guidance on, ser on serving older adolescents in the human and justice system. While all of this extensive planning is underway, the Division of Youth and Family Justice continues to operate safe and secure juvenile justice system for New York City youth. We, we view Raise the Age as an opportunity to strengthen the foundation of our existing system and continue to improve our practice, support our staff, fortify the safety across the entire continuum. As I described previously before to this committee, we have invested heavily in training and other resources to help our staff implement best practices to maintain safe facilities and to create programming and therapeutic interventions that address the risk and needs of our current population. With Raise the Age, we will need to further adapt our services and programming within our commu community, detention and placement programs to meet the needs of older youth, the older youth population. We are developing proposals to expand and strengthen our community-based alternatives for older youth. We have been working with the Department of Design and Construction to make necessary health and safety programmatic and recreational upgrades at Crossroads and Horizon secure detention facilities to prepare for additional older youth. And we are working closely with our close-to-home placement providers to use Raise the Age as an opportunity to think more creatively and expansively about programming for older youth with an emphasis in vocational training, apprenticeships, and licensing programs. As you might imagine, this is a significant undertake, and the Division of Youth and Family Justice has had a long and transparent relationship with the City Council Committee on Juvenile Justice, and we intend to maintain that transparency throughout this planning process as well as throughout the phases of Raise the Age implementation. Given the very aggressive timeline for implementation of this important legislation, we all need to be prepared for the challenges that we will likely encounter as we move to expand our juvenile justice system to support a new population of youth. We will continue to seek your guidance and support as we move ahead with these efforts. Raise the Age is rapidly evolving the endeavor. While we continue to work with our city partners on, on planning for implement, implementation of Raise the Age, including assessing the cost associated with implementation and the optimal use of existing facilities. We also look forward to continued collaboration and partnership with the state to support this massive and crucial reform. We thank the council for your advocacy in support of Raise the Age legislation, and we look forward to working with you on implementation, advocating on behalf of, of, of the city to the state for the support and flexibility needed to make this immensely consequential reform a reality. Thank you.
Thank you so much, and thank you for your testimony. Let me just uh, pause and acknowledge we've been joined by Councilmember Godanchik, Lanceman, and Barron. And I'm going to do something that I normally don't do, and that is allow uh, my colleagues to ask questions first. I have many, many questions, uh, but we'll start with Councilmember Lanceman, followed by Councilmember Barron. May I? May I? say one quick thing before questions because I was remiss in uh, what I'd like to also do is um, acknowledge the, impar the partnership of our labor uh, brothers and sisters in this process as well and I was remi remiss when I spoke about the importance of different partnerships in making this implementation a success and not being explicit in the critical role that the staff will play and so I don't want to interrupt but I didn't want to let it go by without making that explicit. Thank you. Thank you so much. Appreciate that. Thank you, and I'm glad that you added that because in listening to the to the testimony, um, in particular, I saw there's a task force. I did not see any formal representation or recognition of the need to engage the workforce um, in this uh, very bold, uh, I will say experiment, but but that might. Um, call into question the, 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 the wisdom of, of what the city and state are doing. And I don't mean to do that at all, but I, I am, am heartened to hear that, that recognition because um, those are the folks that we rely on to get uh, the real scoop of what's going on in the front lines. So I'm, I'm glad to hear that. Um, I have one question. I know my colleagues have many others, and I appreciate the chair's indulgence in, in letting me ask this. Um, one thing that has caught my caught my attention is um, you say, because age and security classifications may not correlate exactly to juvenile status at JDs, JOs, or AOs, we request that co-mingling restrictions within housing, education, recreation, and programming be determined by the city's classification systems rather than their court status alone. We get nervous when the Department of Education is putting kids of very different ages together in the same building, <clears throat> even in the same campus. So the um, idea that you are going to uh, mix ages amongst um, uh, folks in, in your, young people in your, in your, in your custody is something that, that's very concerning to me. I understand, you know, as you phrase it, you're gonna be mindful of safety concerns, et cetera. But can you tell me what are, what are the best practices that are out there in all those other jurisdictions where young people are not sent to adult facilities because um, this is raising alarm bells in my head? Yeah, I, I want to be very clear that we would contemplate and are planning for a, classica a classification system that does separate based on age, so we will not be contemplating uh, mixing between a, the youngest adolescents and an older population. So what we're developing is an individualized classification system that can look at factors such as age, but also other needs and risk uh, that are able to make those most appropriate individualized determinations. And just as an example, you can have under the new Raise the Age system uh, a J.O. and an A.O. that are the exact same age and might even have a, a similar court, just have come through a different court process. So in fact, the concerns and consideration about how we safely consider age and other factors will be developed as part of the classification system, which we're working with a national expert on, and I'll let ACS and DOC speak to the specifics. But uh, those are the exact types of considerations that we certainly want to ensure are part of how young people are housed or separated in programming, education, and recreation. It just, we think it's actually most appropriate for, happen, for it to happen through a classification system rather than just the court status. Uh, and um, Council Member Langsman, I mean, safety is achieving facilities by actually housing kids appropriately. And our current practice in secure detention, non-secure detention, and even close to home uses developmental um, needs and age as a way of dividing kids. So we actually, particularly, if you go to Crossroads today, we have a lot of the kids who actually are in middle school separated from the kids who are actually going to high school. And it just plays better in terms of safety and management. 
that's how we do it. We won't plan to change that. Okay. Mr. Chairman, thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, Councilmember Barron, followed by Councilmember Perkins. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you to the panel. I have a few questions. First, I want to say that I'm very disappointed that Albany did not have 18-year-olds included in this Razy Age. I think that we allowed Albany to um, diminish the impact of what it was we were trying to do by stopping capping it at 17. I think it should have been extended to 18, so I just wanted to say that. I have crossroads uh, in the neighboring district for mine. It's in Brownsville, and the chair did arrange for us to have a visit there. And uh, the students, that, the children that were there, I particularly looked at it from the perspective of education because you may know that's my background for several decades prior to this. So as you talk about juvenile delinquents who are children ages 7 to 17 who've committed misdemeanors and low-level offenses, and understanding that that's quite a range. You're talking about children in second grade up to children who are high school seniors, perhaps. Mm -hmm. How are we going to differentiate their housing as well as their instruction, knowing that they have very different needs? Mm -hmm. I think it's a fair point. I mean, something to keep in mind is that actually not all juvenile delinquents are in detention are in secure detention. And, you know, a fact that actually we should be proud of, of in New York City now is that the majority of actually younger than 13 young people that we have in detention are usually in non-secure detention placements. One of the things the city is investing is in enhancing our non-secure detention continuum, and we hope that, you know, we could influence the courts and others to have a significant number of the younger kids be in non-secure detention sites. So, but we do have young, young kids, and actually we had a graduation recently for middle school kids out of secure detention. We, we do everything that we can to have them in different halls. So they'll be in different halls based on the mm -hmm. age and what the offenses are. And we certainly know that we're going to have to have a certain kind of training mm -hmm. that will be necessary for the staff. How do you envision, do you envision that there'll be a number of increased, an increased number of employees that will have to be hired for this? What kind of training will they have? How will you do outreach to get that? What involvement will the community have in that? And especially in terms of the community, mm -hmm. um, you talked about an, an intake center. Where will that be located? Did you talk about it? The intakes? intake uh, center, it, we are looking at and hoping that um, we receive support from the state in using it is Ella McQueen, um, and it is in Ocean Hill. Ocean Hill, Brownsville? Yes. Okay, it's so wait, wait. Ocean Hill, Brownsville. So that's a second facility in the same community where Crossroads presently exists. It is a facility that is currently uh, Office of Children and Family Services facility that serves, um, it's an intake reception center, so it currently has the use of a detention facility. It's currently, since the passage of Close to Home, not serving young people from New York City, and uh, that is why we believe that it might be something that is, uh, you know, a possibility for the city to use. Have you spoken to Community Board 16 about this possibility, this consideration? Because we I haven't heard it brought forward at the board meetings that I've been at. So I, I, I have not been to that particular community board meeting. I think we are committed to um, speaking with all of the local stakeholders. So you say you haven't been at that session. meeting. Has it been presented to the community board? So there has not been a requirement to present this. Right now we've asked... Whether or not it's a requirement, don't you think that it would be important to engage the community, to let them know that this is something you're considering, and to get them to participate in how that might happen, if it happens going forward? Certainly. We have done a number of notifications to community leaders and would be available to provide a fuller briefing to any on this. Have you done a notification plans. to that particular community leader? I will have to get back to you with an answer. I don't think that, that that's call. happened because it hasn't been brought to me that that's something that uh, the city is considering. Mm -hmm. And again, I think that as soon as these bright ideas pop up mm -hmm. as possibilities, 
There should be an opportunity for the local leadership and the community people at large to be able to be involved and voice their concerns and opinions about that. Um, Council Member Baron, I yes. just want to mention something regarding Ella McQueen, just because I have a unique perspective of having overseen that facility when I was a commissioner of CFS. Um, I think what the city is actually intending to do, which is actually asking the state to use a facility that is actually now used for juvenile delinquents, for kids who are not from New York City, to be actually allowed to be used by New York City for our children in New York City. So I welcome your uh, feedback and strategy on how we can actually work together to get the state to finally make this facility, which is in the community, instead of being used for kids that are far away from New York City for our children in New York City. Thank you. I understand that this is a change in the population that's going to be uh, possibly housed there, but I still say at the first consideration sure. that the community should have been involved in that. I thank you for that. Um, now, and I follow also uh, my colleague, uh, Council Member Lanson, raised the question that I had raised as well, uh, that I had thought about as well. So we're talking about commingling, uh, and you're talking about using other criteria, age plus needs plus the risks. Is there a possibility then that we'll be undermining the intent of being specific to bring the services to children at a particular age of development, if we're talking about co-mingling, perhaps you need to make it clearer to me what kind of mingling and how will it not interfere with the intent of what this is to have age-appropriate settings and education and recreation. Age is the consideration that we want to use in making any type of co-mingling restrictions or uh, determination. So uh, I think that it will exactly allow us to be able to deliver that type of age-appropriate services. Okay, and uh, just a few more questions. I know my colleagues have questions as well. Perhaps I can come back with the second one, uh, the second round afterwards. But it talks about, in terms of the money, do you have any idea of what it will cost as we talk about training that has to be conducted, perhaps new employees that have to be hired. So do we have any calculations or projections as to what it would cost? And how are we going to do this outreach uh, to bring on this new crop of employees that might be needed? So I can speak just generally in terms of raise the age and if ACS wants to offer anything just in terms of recruitment of new employees, please do. Uh, we certainly understand that the cost of implementing Raise the Age across the board will be significant for New York City. There's a number of different agencies that are implicated in this, so whether that is uh, increased um, attorneys for corp counsel who are the prosecutors in family court, the ability for the Department of Probation to provide uh, comprehensive adjustment and diversion services. Of course, the ACS need to hire additional staff to operate the facilities are just some examples of the types of costs that we anticipate for the city. So as we are working uh, with all of the city agency partners to understand what the um, uh, full costs and implementation plans will be, we are, you know, we'll be able to provide a more accurate final number as to what the budget um, uh, is that we anticipate. Certainly because we recognize that it will be significant is part of why we are requesting that funding support from the state. It is certainly not unique to New York City that there will be a cost implication of Raise the Age, um, although we believe that given that we serve um, such a significant proportion of the young people in the state that this is relevant for, that we should benefit from any type of state compensation. Um, but it is certainly something that we are aware of and planning for, and perhaps uh, mm -hmm. you can speak to yeah. ACS's preparation. Yeah, I, I, well, I guess I'll, I'll, I'll pass on that because we'll have budget hearings coming up shortly. Okay. But just a final question. What are the advantages of the dual licensure, licensure that you're talking about? What's the advantage of that? We believe that it provides us the maximum flexibility, which is what is required to be um, able to house all of the young people who are um, on Rikers Island, effective October 2018, the incoming young people following Raise the Age and the city's um, current, uh, uh, and the youth that will be in the juvenile detention. And so if we have um, those three facilities that are able to be used for those populations, we can use 
the classification system to make those determinations based off of age, based off of any type of other security consideration, based off of what's required programmatically, and yet still be able to have sufficient capacity across the system to be in compliance with the law. Thank you, thank you, Mr. Chair. Just one comment, I think that the city still is not doing enough uh, to prevent young people being caught up in this system. I think the city has an obligation to do more to provide those programs that don't, that will allow children to be involved in activities and programs that keep them busy and occupied so that they go home tired and go to bed because we're not doing enough to interrupt this mass cost incarceration problem that we have. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you so much. Chair. And uh, I want to echo, uh, before I turn it over to Councilmember Perkins, uh, the, uh, the next step to meet uh, with the council member, with the community board, and the stakeholders there, because usually our type of communities usually bear the brunt of having this type of facility. Councilmember Perkins, thank you for your patience. Thank you very much. Just I want to follow up a, a little bit to the previous question regarding uh, the community's involvement with regard to these placements. Uh, is there a policy, a practice that automatically requires some kind of communication when such facilities are going into a member's district? So because these are facilities that are currently used in a, um, uh, as juvenile detention, we um, do not need to go through the Euler process. However, we certainly hear the uh, recommendation and concern about appropriate community notification and engagement. And so, you know, we did intend and, and make that type of notification, but if there, we want to continue to do that moving forward and certainly think that those neighborhoods' participation and input in this is critical, and so we would welcome continued engagement at the neighborhood level, certainly on, on, in these facilities. So you answered that as if it's an intention, not necessarily a requirement. So, mm -hmm. the, you know, they, they, there's a road paved with mm -hmm. intentions. Mm -hmm. We are, let me be very clear, we are committed to doing uh, community engagement. We all engagement. know where it leads. Mm -hmm. Yes. Trouble. So what, what do we do to make intentions requirements? We would welcome all, any council member's suggestions as to how we can be better partners with your neighborhoods on this. We would be committed to following up on. Okay. So you hear a suggestion being coming out of my mouth that it be a requirement? Mm -hmm. Is that what you're telling me you agree with? We absolutely agree that we will, we, we will take that as a requirement. And even if we're not going through the standard Euler process, we are committed to making it a requirement of this plan that we engage with the communities, yes. Okay. So how can we be sure it's going to be taken that way beyond this, this morning? You know what I'm saying? Because the, the, you don't want people feeling as if in their communities they're being invaded as opposed to participating in a decision mm -hmm. that makes sense to them. Mm -hmm. you, you understand the concern there? Because otherwise, your good intentions will be on a slippery slope to demonstrations and protests and other kinds of cynical, cynical mm -hmm. reactions. Yeah, I mean, I think... I think this is very, very important for mm -hmm. that, that kind of partnership be established. Mm -hmm. and, and maybe, Council Member, we, we actually had had meetings um, to the community, community district number one, which is where actually... I'm sorry, I, I, can't, I can't... We have actually had had meetings with community district number one uh, in the Bronx, where actually Horizons is located. I think what I'm hearing loud and clear for you is that we should extend those kind of meetings for the community district in Brooklyn, where Crossroads is actually currently located, and I will follow up with those. Well, well you, we're on the right track, I guess, in terms of responding, but, I, but we want to make sure that all this is, has like a community-based process of awareness and approval, or at least some kind of interaction, not as a afterthought, but as a sort of vision. Mm -hmm. I, I think you have our commitment and partnership in this. Um, we have been focused uh, incredibly aggressively on just the trying to m focus on what needs to be done to achieve the implementation of Raise the Age. We, would, we know that the neighborhoods, community staff, 
partners in the criminal justice system, the neighborhood organizations and providers to get to the prevention services that Council Member Barron spoke about mm -hmm. and, you know, would certainly affirm the importance of that. All of these people and representatives and constituencies will be key to our success in this um, and are certainly, you know, will follow up to make sure that whatever it is that um, you'd like us to continue to do in terms of engagement, um, that we are doing that. Thank you very much for moving in that direction. I, I, I hope that this is done not just in the context of these kind of hearings, that this is done in the context of when you make a decision about a community mm -hmm. that has to embrace this um, and help make it successful, especially for those who will be a part of it. Yeah. I, I think on something that I, I want to um, pinpoint is that um, if you think about our two facilities, Horizon You know, of course, I, I, you know, we have these kind of facilities in our neighborhoods. Mm -hmm. Some of them are prisons <laughs> mm -hmm. that um, presumably are put in our neighborhoods because the people presumably come from our neighborhoods, mm -hmm. not always. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's the first thing we have to dispel. But secondly, there has to be that kind of a partnership with those stakeholders mm -hmm. in our neighborhoods. Otherwise, we're doing something hostile that will have a negative impact on those mm -hmm. who we're trying to serve. Yeah, and I couldn't agree more. I mean, if you think about any one of our detention sites, we have hundreds of volunteers, most of them from the community. Do you have a list of sites that are in communities where there's community partnerships? Uh, the, the two secure detention sites that we talked about? Yeah. Yes. We, we could provide those addresses. Yes, please do. Sure. Now, uh, I know uh, an important partner in all this is the state. Where are we at with the state's you know, support and partnership? We have been, since the passage of the law, um, meeting with the state and uh, feel as though we've got a good level of coordination. Um, the, obviously, the requests that we outlined this morning that are required for us to be able to implement Raise the Age, uh, we are hopeful that, we will, um, that they will be well received by, uh, by the state. And so, you know, that we, we, can, we will continue to work with them on this and uh, are optimistic that we'll get the best outcome. So, in that regard, what, 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 where have you found some sort of agreements or some, some sort of partnerships or whatever it is that you're looking for? We have, so we have um, been meeting with them just in terms of understanding the, you know, how they were analyzing uh, Raise the Age. We've been sharing the city's plans. The plan that we presented this morning or this afternoon to the council, we also have just recently shared with the state for their approval. Uh, including both the asks that we will need from them, including use of their OCFS facility, uh, the dual licensure, um, the ability to use the city's classification system, support for funding. So we are uh, waiting um, responses from the state, but we've just presented this for approval and, um, you know, again, have been working well with them and are optimistic that this is something that we can jointly move forward on. On, on the detention side, we actually haven't planned or designed any construction. We're actually talking to the state first because we're actually under the oversight of OCFS. They have been amenable um, and excited that we're finally making these enhancements at the facilities and are very supportive of that. But again, we continue as the city to advocate on the, to the state in behalf of preventive services, more resources for detention and more resources for placement. Right. So, um, if you can like, keep us in the in the conversation, and, because this is, this is a big deal for our communities, and can be very controversial, provocative. You know, people mm -hmm. they, they don't understand what you're doing, and, and they assume the worst. Uh, and, and then we then we get called to try to put to fires out that don't have to be. But, but because of the careless way sometimes in which we implement good ideas, mm -hmm. they create big problems. Yeah, and we welcome any of your advice on how to deal with Albany, as you know it very well. All right. Thank you. Let's, let's stay in touch. Thank you so much, uh, Councilman Perkins. Uh, I have several questions. Uh, first, let me start uh, with the Ella McQueen uh, facility. Can you be a little bit more specific as to its current use? How many young people are there? Where are they coming from? What age group uh, are we talking about? We, we don't have that information. I mean, we do know that actually it's a reception center. 
for young people who are being adjudicated to the custody of OCFS. And as of race no age, no young people are adjudicated from New York City to the custody of OCFS. So do you know its capacity or how many the young people will be able to hold? The capacity uh, is just over 40. Um, we have, you know, indication that it has been operating at less than a third of that recently, and as noted, since close to home, you know, not with young people from New York City. But we estimate that it'll be about an addition. It's a 40-bed facility. 40 beds. So, okay, help me here. So, be 40 there. Where would the rest of the 210? young people will end up at? So the renovations that are currently underway at Crossroads and Horizon would provide a capacity of 106 beds at Horizon and 96 beds at Crossroads. Okay, so back in January when we were here, um, I, I was sending the alarm as to we're going to run out of time, we're going to run out of time because I know how construction, especially when it comes to the city, it just... It just takes forever. Uh, and the response that I got back was that we were waiting for the state to give us their regs, to give us their instructions, so we couldn't begin in Horizon doing work and also a crossroads or wherever else. Did we get instructions from them or? How did, how did so the, explain me the process here? So the regulations, we, uh, we have not received regulations from the state. Um, because of the tight time frame, of course, uh, we are moving ahead with renovations and have presented those plans to the state. So we have shared the renovation plans for Crossroads and Horizon, and those renovations are currently underway. Um, I should also say that, you know, we've had some support from the controller's office, which has been greatly appreciated to make sure that we can expedite procurement on, on all of that and just, you know, a real recognition of the urgency of raise the age and making sure that these facilities can be in a state of good repair and have sufficient programming um, and recreational space uh, by next year. And so all of that is currently underway, although we are certainly still waiting regulations. Our hope is that in, when, as we presented the plans um, to the state and have provided the ability for OCFS and SEOC to tour the facilities and look at it, what it is that we're contemplating that we are on track um, and that there, you know, there shouldn't be any concerns. Uh, but, but of course, it is one of the reasons that we feel some urgency about having regulations um, because the, we renovations are underway and we do need some clarity there. So we kind of move in by faith here, right? That good faith and hopefully with a good intention in the state that they're basically going to say, go ahead, you have a good plan. But if they come back with a completely different plan, we're talking about that it's going to be more costly, right? And we're going to lose time. And what happens if that happens? So I think we are moving heaven and earth on the city side um, to do what we can uh, to prepare for Raise the Age. Um, and we are, you know, optimistic that <laughs> in sharing what the plans are and in sharing what our needs are to be in compliance, um, that we will get that cooperation. Um, but, you know, Yes, uh, you are right that, that we, we do need that partnership from the state for this to be possible. Why are they moving I mean, so slowly? Yeah. I mean, I, I know you can't talk on their behalf, but do you ha is there anything prohibiting them from coming down and saying, hey, in light of the fact that you met with them, and I'd love to find out how many times you had an opportunity to sit with them, why are they being so slow in light of the fact that we have to be there by next year? And the earliest we could have gotten there was in April, as many people know in this room. So what is, is there some, something prohibiting them from moving forward? And I certainly wouldn't want to speak on the state's behalf. Um, I can say that we've had a fruitful dialogue. We've had two in-person meetings. Um, actually, I'm sorry, three in-person meetings. Uh, from that have participation of city agencies in the state um, since passage of Raise the Age. And when um, was that? The most recent one was in November. Um, the, there was one over the summer, as, and then um, there was one prior. I, I don't remember the exact month, but shortly following the passage of the law. So 
we feel very good about the level of dialogue that there had been. Um, I don't want to speak on behalf of the state in terms of their process of implementation. Do you think that's enough meetings in order to get this ball rolling? I mean, it just the time we're on the. What happens if we don't we don't get in by October? Which is there's a likelihood that we might not. We are planning uh, to be ready. For October. <laughs> that is the city's plan. But do you have a plan B? What, what happens? Technically, just for my knowledge here, what would happen if we're not there? Not because, you know, I, I'm not looking to place blame. I'm looking for solutions. What would happen if we were in that situation because somebody else is tying our hands? We will be able to have Crossroads and Horizon, um, which provides about 80% of the capacity that we would need. That intake center or that third facility is absolutely key uh, to being able to meet this deadline. I should say that we have looked at over 70 additional sites throughout New York City in trying to understand what the other possibilities might be. Uh, we have looked at um, both privately owned facilities, city, state owned facilities have really you know, tried to understand what the options are because of the um, land use process. It is only a facility that is currently a detention center that allows us to meet this timeline. We looked at the DOC off-island borough facilities and believed that that would be in contradiction to the spirit of Raise the Age to house young people in a juvenile environment. Um, and so we do believe that this facility, this OCFS facility, is our only option. Um, and we require it to have full success in implementing Raise the Age. Are you looking to uh, start ULURP later on? Uh, or will you, do you think Crossroads Horizon plus ELLA is enough? We don't currently have plans for any additional sites. Um, one of our asks to the state is that uh, if they're only able to provide this as a more short-term stopgap measure until the city identified an uh, alternative site, that that is something that we would work on. Uh, so it, let's suppose uh, that they, they do say yes to Ella. Uh, what capacity we will be at, 80%, 90%? We believe that with those three facilities, we will be able to house everyone um, in detention uh, off Rikers Island post raise the age. And, and how many more? Let's say the population were to rise. Uh, where would those kids go? So our raise the age implementation efforts are certainly focused on um, trying to ensure that the types of progress that we've made in reducing crime and funding community-based alternatives and funding diversion programs um, and why we've been able to see such a reduction in the number of people in detention both in ACS facilities and in the custody of DOC. That is progress that we want to build on. Um, now we understand that that certainly requires uh, the full partnership of the courts, the defense, the district attorneys, that we are they are all involved in our Raise the Age implementation efforts. We have a programming and diversion working group that is chaired by ACS and Department of Probation that is looking in particular at what are the types of diversion programs and interventions that are required so that we are not unnecessarily detaining any more young people following Raise the Age. Um, we are committed to both expanding the capacity that's required in family court for that to be possible. We are committed to ensuring that programs that currently exist that serve 16 and 17 year olds can transfer to both family court and these newly created adolescent uh, or youth parts in criminal court. And we are also focused on identifying where there's existing gaps in the continuum and where we actually could develop more services and neighborhood based supports to make sure that we are not detaining more young people unnecessarily post-raise the age. I, I just want us to be mindful, and I love your optimism, and I share it with you mm -hmm. uh, that uh, we're doing the type of work that will create the situation that we have right now that is a better one than it was 10 years ago, let's say, but the population in New York City is going to increase by a million people in 10 years. 
million people are two a million people are leaving the forecast two million are coming in mm -hmm. so just to be mindful yeah. that uh, we will have that situation as good as of a job that we could do the fact is that the ratio of young people uh, is going to increase. Let me ask you a few questions regarding staff. C Council yes. Member, I mean, I, I think sure. you you have been looking at our operations for the last four years, and and again, we have reduced the number of young people in detention by 50 percent, and many folks thought that that was impossible to do. I, I, I want to emphasize that I think Ella McQueen or the concept of an intake facility could be a game changer. I mean, too many of the young persons that you have met at Horizons or Crossroads may be there only for a few days. I mean, we had the opportunity to actually connect to them early on, connect them to counsel, connect them to services. They may not actually even have to get to the facility. I think our secure facility should be for those kids who really pose a risk to the community, for the, those that actually have the need to be there, and a significant number of kids in any one night that actually were just housing for a few days. If we could actually focus on understanding their needs and connect them to the right supports in the community, we could continue to be on what we have done for the last four years. So, uh, you know, it's not just about the beds, it's also about how we approach juvenile justice differently in New York City. Okay, so let's get into a uh, staff question. So my first one is, uh, what staff do we need? We need a significant amount of staff. Um, not how many yet, I, I'm looking at what, what type of staff do yeah. we first need. Yeah. I mean, a juvenile counselor today, and as I think you will agree with me, is possibly one of the most difficult jobs, but actually one of the most unappreciated jobs in New York City. I mean, a juvenile counselor in a typical day actually have to put up with very challenging kids. As we have talked before in previous testimonies, as we divert more and more kids from the juvenile justice system, the kids that we get in detention are kids with high mental health needs. These are really, really challenging young people that need a lot of attention. And to do that job, besides being difficult, our juvenile counselors are under enormous pressure of oversight by external agencies such as the Justice Center. So I think the first thing that you and I have worked on is in acknowledging the heroism of our staff in Crossroads and Horizons, and we need to acknowledge that. We need, to, we need the city needs to step up and finally uh, acknowledge that this is the, a job that actually is integral to maintain and sustain public safety. And we need to attract the right kind of folks, the folks that actually are committed to help young people. We, we know these folks. These are the folks that actually are doing significant work in our churches, in our community programs. They want to make a difference. They want to be part of the civil service uh, you know, future of New York City. So we need to attract those folks. And we're going to need a lot of help to attract them, to support them, and to retain them. How much do they make right now? Um, we, our staff um, begins around 45. And what's thousand. the highest they make? Um, Not when they make without the promotion. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it, it takes a significant amount of time for them to get into the 60s. And, and, and that, that's, and it is, again, and this is when they, they have been with us for a significant amount of time. We, we compare negatively for, with other city civil service jobs. We, I, I would love to see um, our counselors uh, have a more attractive package so we can attract uh, uh, the best uh, next generation of counselors. Uh, have you looked into that? Uh, we into we are in budget? serious conversations with OMB and OLR, and I, I'm reminded about the importance of rewarding our staff and supporting our staff well by Anthony Wells on a daily basis, which I see it not. <laughs> Uh, I mean, they, as you stated, and thank you, Commission, for stating that they have, they're the front lines, and the success, really, of our detention center really begins uh, and is, sust is sustained by the counselors, and they're being asked to really help me understand, they do kind of a dual role, because they're not just counselors, but at the same time, they're doing... Mm -hmm quote unquote security mm -hmm. uh, roles. Yep. It, should that be separated or should it be contained within no, the same role? I mean, uh, the safety of a facility and the ability to help a young person change their behavior is all based on a relationship. And that's actually when our juvenile counselors are at their best. 
They actually know how to leverage your relationship. They actually are role models many times to, uh, to our young people. And actually separating the custody from the relationship building would be a mistake. If there's something that we know about how to sustain safety in a facility, it's about meeting the needs of kids, ensuring that they, they're, they're challenged, and that we actually teach them a new way of behaving. Because at the end of the day, I mean, my job is bigger than just making sure the facility is safe, it's making sure that they come back home and they actually have a different way of dealing with conflicts in their community. Well, I'm happy to hear that you're looking into having, uh, you're, you're speaking to OMB uh, for them to be able to get a significant uh, raise here, starting point, uh, because look, the reality is they're gonna be attracted to other jobs that don't have to deal with this level of pressure, stress, I had the pleasure to go with you se several times, speak to a few counselors uh, on site and out of site, uh, some which live in my neighborhood, and they're stressed out. I mean, they, I mean, they uh, experience sec secondary uh, mm -hmm. post-traumatic stress, um, and now that we have the 16 and 17-year-old. Um, my, my next question is, I know that in, in Rikers Islands there were quite a several problems uh, related uh, to the safety of staff. Uh, what are we planning to do that is different? Okay. Or are we planning to do anything different that was done in Rikers Island? Yeah, I think we have this an opportunity for our colleagues from DOC to talk because there actually has been an amazing amount of progress on the youth side. So over the past several years, we've seen a dramatic decrease in a lot of the violence indicators specifically for adolescents, and we think that this is in large part due to a number of reforms that we put into place for the adolescent population. So starting with staff, we actually started going into the academy and selecting staff that both wanted to work with this population and had backgrounds with working in this population whether they had been social workers before, worked with ACS, a lot of them had juvenile justice backgrounds. So we made sure to select this staff for working with this population. We've also provided them with a number of training programs, uh, safe crisis management, for example, as well as di dialectical behavioral therapy training for uh, the staff working specifically with some of the more aggressive or pop problematic populations. So we think that a lot of this, specifically staff involvement, has led to a lot of the decreases in the violence that we've seen uh, with the adolescent population at RNDC, as well as other reform things like programming and an increase, a dramatic increase in the offering of programming as well as educational programming. I'll tell you what my uh, fear is, and it's a fear that I, I could see why it's there is that the senior members that are working uh, presently as counselors, that they're gonna go uh, else place uh, because the 16 and 17 year olds are coming and then you're gonna end up with a lot of newbies coming in who have not had the experience and they need that level of, of deep mentorship for this type of work, so please, Let's do everything, mm -hmm. everything possible to make sure that we have the retention level, that there's a high level dialogue uh, with uh, the union, for the so. staff, to listen to their ideas mm -hmm. of staff. I know the last time that we were, uh, we had a hearing, one of the things that, that I, I heard from one of the coaches was that a lot of times a plan is brought in, it takes about five years before the staff buy into it, and a lot of staff feel like mm -hmm. we know what to do. Can we take that, our ideas, find the best possible model that is out there that matches their vision, and, and then you know the buy-in is already there, uh, and, and they feel like not only they're being heard, but uh, their feelings and um, strategies are validated. How many staff, how many counselors do we need? How many counselors what? Do we need? 
So we, we expect that if we're going to manage all the juvenile delinquents and juvenile offenders appropriately, because as you mentioned before, our staff is stretched and we mandate too many overtimes too often in a week, we will need at least 60 new counselors by 2018. If we are to manage the whole system, which is the intent of the administration, we're going to need at least 300 more people by 2020. By 2020, 300? More, besides the 50 now. So when do, are we looking to start the recruitment? We are working with OLR and others to first figure out how to make this job appealing and attractive, which is what the union will remind me and my staff will remind me. I mean, it doesn't make any sense to continue to bring people on board if we're going to lose them and they're going to go to other jobs. So I think we need to take care of that first. Do Once we do that, uh, we're soon going to be coming to everyone in this room to ask for help in recruitment. Do, do we have, so when do you foresee that we'll be ready to say, hey, we, we got a package here that's mm -hmm. going to be very attractive and it's going to, we're going to be able to keep our counselors. When do you think we have that ready by? We, we, are, working in, we are working with DCAS, and then we, this will be negotiated with the union. At the end of the day, it's up to the members and the union to let us know what is really attractive for their members. So we, we're, we're hoping that that will happen soon. Uh, my, I sh you can imagine my concern is that, yeah, time is and I'm sure it's a bigger concern for you, that the training begins on time, uh, I'm sorry, the recruitment, mm -hmm. then the training. Uh, what would the training uh, look like? Yeah, we're actually reviewing that. We have actually expanded our pre-service academy that used to be about 10 weeks to 12 weeks. Um, <coughs> we are learning that that may not be enough. And actually, from what are we hearing from our staff is that what is essential, and I'm looking up some of them are looking at Parker here now, who usually reminds me of this. What is really essential is that actually you have the technical assistance and the training embedded within the facilities. Because these are not the things that you learn in the classroom. You could do a very lengthy training, but unless you have experts reminding the staff and supporting the staff of how to apply the techniques or how to de-escalate behavior, and that only happens in the context of the facility, the staff doesn't get better. Do we have so, consultants? Uh, so we, we, as of two months ago, began actually doing training inside the facilities, particularly around safe crisis management. We want to build more of that, building the expertise within the teams. And again, as Parker reminded me of them, making sure that we have practice opportunities consistently, not just once a year, but almost every week, because that's how you become good at any, anything. I have a few more questions, but uh, Councilman Barry has a question. Thank you. I have a follow-up question. I asked you about uh, the advantages of the dual licensure, but can you explain to me, please, the difference between the secure, specialized secure detention facility and the secure juvenile detention facility, and what can go on at one that can't go on at another? So the specialized secure detention facility is, uh, it, it is part in the passage of Raise the Age. It is the facility that uh, was defined to house the adolescent offenders and there will be, there is a joint regulation process between the State Commission of Corrections and Office of Children and Family Services. We are, the regulations that will govern exactly what can happen at a specialized secure detention facility and how that may or may not be different from a secure detention facility, which is under the purview of Office of Children and Family Services, is an open question and is part of why we are feel that urgency to be able to understand what the regulations will be. Um, but that is a newly created category in Raise the Age. Oh, specialized secure detention is a new category. Yes. Yeah. And presently, neither Cross Roads nor Horizon qualify? So that hasn't existed up until this point. So right now, Crossroads and Horizon are licensed as secure detention facilities by OCFS. Right. The specialized secure detention facility does not, it's not something that currently exists, and there are no regulations that govern that. That is created by Raise the Age. They will, uh, we are waiting for the regulations that will outline what those facilities look like. We understand that they will be uh, more comparable to a juvenile model, 
but that is the only information that we have. The law so we don't know yet mm -hmm. what a secured, a specialized secure detention center will require? No. But yet and still we want to, so we're being proactive. We want to apply for that and say whatever it is, we want that to be applied to Crossroads and Which Horizon. Which is also why we are requesting some flexibility um, and a waiver process uh, as appropriate from the state. So because we haven't had a chance to review what those regulations are, but because of this very aggressive timeline, we have had to, of course, move ahead in preparation, and ACS and DOC have been working very closely together to develop what the, you know, the operational plan should be based off of the best practices in a juvenile model and informed by adolescent development, but we don't actually have clarity as to what will and will be allowed um, from the regulations. So we're asking to see the draft regulations as soon as possible, or asking by the end of this year, which was, you know, we think a, an initial timeline that the state had, had mentioned, but also for some flexibility so that if there is a conflict between what we are currently planning and what the regulations allow, that there's some waiver process by which and, and recognition of the flexibility required for us to still be able to move ahead now and meet this deadline. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So in short, the state, I'll say it, because it's easier for me to say it than for you to say it, the state is just basically dragging their feet. Uh, they're being extremely slow, like governmental molasses. Uh, and we, we just, it's, uh, I commend you for moving forward, and you're moving forward with, quote unquote, by faith that they're going to respond positively. I'm, I'm worried that they're going to come back and they say, no, you can't do this, you can't do that, by the way, and, and so forth. Um, it's been a year, and it's, uh, let's be real, it's been more than a year than you in 2012, 2013, 2014, 16, 17. This was coming, it was just mm -hmm. a matter of time. So, you know, I'm disappointed that they've just been simply so slow. You don't have to comment on that because uh, it's better if I say it. Uh, so, uh, but I just wanted to put it out there publicly. I wanted to ask you regarding the task group. Remind me again who's in the task group? So, uh, we have um, a steering committee, which is the city agencies. So, that is. Um, all of, the, all of the city agencies that have some role in this. So um, ACS, probation, the law department, Department of Education, um, DDC, OMB, um, we have representation from uh, the city hall uh, and the deputy mayors. It's chaired by the mayor's office of criminal justice. We also have Judge Edwina Mendelson um, on behalf of the courts. Uh, we are in the four working groups, um, court processing, programming and diversion, data analytics, and facilities. Uh, we have participation um, from all of the city agencies as well as the defender community, the district attorneys, and the courts. Um, we have begun engaging with nonprofit providers. Um, I think that moving forward, we'd like even deeper engagement with nonprofit providers. I think want to continue and deepen the engagement with staff um, as part of this implementation effort. So uh, we've launched these working groups and um, have brought in national technical assistance and local technical assistance, including the Vera Institute, CCI, the Annie Casey Foundation, um, CJA, Bennett Midland to you know provide appropriate support, um, but we you know will be getting will be expanding the uh, participation from other interested stakeholders. In it. Yeah, I would think that it'd be wise to include the staff since mm -hmm. they're the ones who do the work. Absolutely. Uh, and they could you know add just make your voice stronger, mm -hmm. you know the chorus of voices stronger and add uh, to the discussion. I, I'm curious, uh, the letter that is going out today, and thank you so much uh, for giving it to us, uh, would it have been better to have sent it earlier uh, this year? We have been um, in communication about the tenets of the letter, and which is basically the city's plan for Raise the Age. It frankly you know, took some time for us to finalize our plans. As I said earlier, we evaluated 70 different sites, have really been um, working very intensively to make sure that we had the best possible plan, uh, have stayed in touch with the state and sh communicated our thinking along the way. Um, 
as soon as that plan was finalized, we shared it with them, and uh, you know they requested that we put this in writing, um, and we have followed up to do so and to you know make clear the things that we'll require. Um, my last question, unless my colleagues uh, have another question, um, it's just. It, uh, at least in my mind, I'm still a little nebulous about the commingling. So let me be more, a little bit more concrete, I guess. Uh, so, I, would they commingle, for example, in the lunch area? So I, I don't know that we have the the. Can you speak to this? The, I don't think that there is a, the classification system yet is not in place. Um, I th there will be different restrictions on uh, commingling based on housing, programming, recreation, education as appropriate. Um, if, if there's any additional info that you can offer, I mean, on I can that. only talk about our current practices. Again, we try, we, ha we house youth based on developmental needs. We sometimes house youth based on particular needs, particular mental health. Um, Again, what we have now are juvenile delinquents and juvenile offenders, and on many occasions, actually, we have seen a lot of value in doing activities together in, across different age groups, and particularly our programs with Carnegie Hall, and actually particularly when we can allow young people's interests to be met in an efficient way. So some of the vocational programs and some of the internship programs that we are beginning to develop with DOE you know, kids can opt into it, and that works fairly well. We, we're not there yet. I mean, I think, you know, from the city council, we heard this loud and clear. I hear it loud and clear from our, mem from our staff. Um, developmental age makes sense. I mean, you don't have 11-year-olds with 17-year-olds. So we, we will keep that in mind when we develop a classification system. Yeah, my concern is, for example, you have in lunch a 17-year-old around a third. What's your youngest? Uh, Insecure detention. Mm -hmm, security. Uh, they could go as low as seven, but we haven't had anyone below 11 recently. But like right now, who's the youngest, like 13? I don't know. I need so to let's say you have a 13-year-old, around 17-year-old, 12-year-old, yeah. uh, they're in lunch, mm -hmm. and so just the intimidation factor. Yeah, yeah. and again, you know, we, we manage our facility, you know, as much as possible within groups, so it's not like everyone goes to hall, to lunch all at once. We, we have movements, we actually move different halls at different moments. Because again, at the end of the day, the staff that works in that hall knows the kids better, they know their triggers, they know who they don't get along with. So for safety purposes, a lot of the work in the facility is about helping the staff and the kids stay together. How long will corrections be involved? So um, our current, uh, the, the contemplated timeline is that within 24 months, there'd be a phase over to ACS as primarily responsible, even though ACS will be, of course, involved along the way in providing some services uh, throughout. We are jointly developing that model, and ACS and DOC are working together on that to ensure that it is a juvenile model and that the model of care that we're using these in these facilities is one that is consistent. And so even during that phase transition that we have that type of continuity. Um, on the classification system, I just wanted to uh, underscore that, you know, the, the point in the concern around separate appropriation, uh, appropriate separation between different age groups, and in particular older and younger youth, um, I think is fundamental and would certainly be part of this classification system and, you know, something that we would ensure is part of this. I appreciate that answer. Um, okay. Uh, would you uh, be uh, amicable to have a staff to stay back so they could hear uh, the testimonies uh, of those uh, that will follow you? Is that possible? We, yeah, and, and, and definitely going to stay behind to hear what Anthony is going to say. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> we, will, we will absolutely have staff here to, to hear. And I mean, I think as we said in the beginning, um, just recognize that a lot of people here are both those who made Raise the Age possible and those who are currently doing the incredibly hard work that has helped to make our juvenile justice system what it is to date. So yes, we, we welcome being able to stay and hear their testimony. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, you brought more clarity uh, to the questions that we have. We're looking forward uh, to continuing this partnership and working together. Thank you, Thank you so much. Uh, with that, uh, we'll have uh, Bruce Payne from Local 371 and Anthony Wells, President 
of 371. Thank you. Whenever you're ready, and if you don't mind introducing yourself. Not a Thank problem, you. I'm at 3.30. Oh. Thank you. Takes me a little while, Chairman, to <laughs> walk across these days. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Anthony Wells. I am the president of the Social Service Employees Union Local 371. We represent uh, employees in secure detention of many titles including juvenile counselors, as well as caseworkers, social workers, and other staff. Let me just give you a little aside. I happen to have started in the Department of Juvenile Justice as a caseworker in June of 1980. I then went to BCW in 1983 as a caseworker. And then I went to work for the union in 1988. So over the last 37 years, I've been involved with both child welfare and juvenile justice, either as an employee or representative of the members that work in these agencies. And even given that, I am not the expert. It's the workers who do this work every day. They're the technicians. They're the experts. They're the ones who, who bridge philosophy and policy and deal with reality. And they do a good job. I, um, I listen to, to, to the city and I listen to uh, my friend, uh, Deputy Commissioner Franco, and he's correct in terms of their reaching out to begin to work with the unions and have real discussions. But we pride ourselves in not just being a union that represents members, but a union with a social conscience. It was this union that had a strike in 1965 that led to collective bargaining. And during that strike, we fought for rights of welfare recipients to enjoy the normal amenities that people will enjoy in those days. Uh, so we don't just worry about our members, but we actually worry about the people we service. And in this instance, we worry about these children. Uh, we do have a concern, and this is a real time. I'm not here to blast the city. I'm not interested in blasting the city. We're here to ensure that all parties are included in the development of plan. This is something new that they never had. It's interesting that I actually see the end of this law when I also saw the beginning of the law. Juvenile Department of Juvenile Justice was created because these laws was created in the late 70s uh, and decided that we ought to try our children as adults. It, it has not gone well for 30 years. So we are in support of raising the age. I will also say something that other people can't say. And we have no interest in getting involved in any squabble between the state and the city. And the city is under a tremendous amount of pressure to get this done in an unreasonable amount of time. The concept is wonderful, but if you don't do it right, you will not achieve the goal of raise the age. It's to provide services for this population and to help in their development. So if they want to do a comprehensive plan, then they have to look at what they want to do in terms of the development of this population. For example, we need to in, in have real programs, and programs that talk about using skills, like learning how to be a carpenter, and working with the unions to, to, to have a transition from incarceration to meaningful job employment or enhancement of your skills. That has to be real. You know, it's, it's just not, everybody doesn't respond to textbooks in the same manner as they do with the ability to use their hands and their creative minds. And we have to enhance that with this population. If you don't have the right kind of programs in place, it doesn't work. Our juvenile council, we went to the city a year ago, over a year ago, before Raise the Age was passed and said, we want to work with this population. We actually believe that our juvenile counselors are the best trained to work with teenagers in this kind of setting because they've been doing it over the years. And we actually want to do this. <laughs> we actually said, we can help you. It's not even just about jobs, and, and jobs are important. 
having a stable community and economy is important. But you must include all the stakeholders. And I'm glad to hear you, Mr. Chairman, and your council people remind us that you can have all the policies in the world, you can have all the experts in the world, but if you don't include the people that do this job every day, your, your ability to be successful is greatly diminished. Salary, I think the commissioner misquoted. <laughs> I wish it was $45,000. <laughs> it's not. It's more like $38,000, $39,000 to start. And we've had enhancements. But clearly in the new world, where you're gonna ask for enhanced skills, a desire to have people who wanna do this, then we have to talk about adequate compensation in order to retain people. And there's one more piece before I have the real expert testify. You must have real security issues addressed. I heard someone mention SCM. Uh, we believe SCM does not work in this population. That's our belief. We can back it up in many, many, many ways. You must develop more creative ways to deal with this. And you must also deal with safety of these residents and the staff. What happens when staff are attacked? What happens when, when rules are not obeyed? You have to have a system that says that can't continue, otherwise you don't have any control. And there's not enough anti-gang <laughs> involvement, deterrence. Deterrence, uh, just a specialty of that, because in an incarcerated system, particularly in a juvenile system, joining a gang is your protection. And if you think that they can protect you better than the people who are paid to do so, here's your choice. So these things must be considered in a whole. So it's an honor for us to be here. We're glad you're having this. Um, I, I think that everybody's voice is important, including the advocates out there who, who have been looking out for the residents for years, including management, and without a doubt, the voice of the staff. Let me say that again. Because sometimes you think you talk to staff and forget about their representative. But the voice of the members is the union. And we are prepared, this local, to sit and talk to you, anybody in the city. And by the way, we're having a conversation with them next week. Okay, and, and, I, and I thank you guys for doing that. And thank the administration for listening. But in order to make this successful, because it has to be successful, we need all of us to deal with this. Thank you for the opportunity, Chairman. Mr. Payne. Hello. Uh, I'm a little tired. I work, I work at night, so I'm just going to read what this is, but I'm a little vague. But. If you could bring the mic just a little bit closer. Thank right. you. Better. Um, good afternoon. My name is Bruce Payne. I'm a juvenile counselor in the Horizons facility. I've worked as a juvenile counselor for the last 27 years plus. I bring a wealth of hands-on experience. I would like to thank Chair Fernando Cabrera and the Committee on Juvenile Justice for the opportunity to give me this testimony. Let me first start out by saying that being a juvenile counselor is a very demanding job. The other counselors and I work with residents who are alleged to have committed various serious crimes. Many have charges against them in family, criminal, and or Supreme Court. The two big problems in this agency, in my view, are the lack of consequences for a resident's negative behavior. Right now, we have the ASPIRE program, which stands for Action, Safety, Participation, Inner Development, Respect, Education. The goals report shows that the programs, the program is not a deterrent when residents want to act out in negative behavior. You would have to look back into the archives of at least five years to see what I'm talking about. If a resident wants to fight, attack staff, be part of gang activity, or destroy agency property, they have bolded out zero fear of this program. Then you have the SEM, which stands for Safety Crisis Management. This technique is what we have to use to stop a resident from attacking staff, including being choked from behind, attacked by more than one resident, 
on when a resident is using an object to try and harm you and breaking up fights. I am here to tell you it does not work in real time. We are taught this technique when we first get the job, then we get a refresher course once a year. Staff have gone out on workers' comp or even left the job after an experience of dealing with a resident that leads to a physical altercation. This is why we have such a high turnover of workers. You can look up the stats in the archives, go back at least five years. Having the 16 and 17 year old youths coming from Rikers Island or from the street will make the job more, and I bold this out, dangerous than ever before. This agency has a history of being reactive as opposed to being proactive. God forbid a staff member get seriously hurt on the job for coming to work and trying to make a positive change in the lives of the residents who are detained in our custody. In closing, I would like to say I have offered this agency three ideas I fear would help this agency run better. I've given these ideas to Commissioner David Hansel, Deputy Commissioner Felipe Franco. I have yet to get back a response back, so I'm offering these copies for the record, and I'm going to hand deliver to you. Yeah. We have pr contraband prevention, we have zero tolerance on gang activity, and we have this, what I've created called Back to Basics. I also suggest that a monthly copy of the goals report be forwarded to the city council chairperson on juvenile justice. Thank you for allowing me to share my view of the agency and give ideas to make it better. I'm now, sorry. I'm sorry. Yeah. yeah, just and one other thing, um, and I didn't write this down, but this is just part of the rebuttal to what I heard in regards to uh, uh, capacity of housing residents. Uh, I've worked in the Horizons facility since that building has been open. As you know, I started in July 1990. Uh, the capacity has shrunk. Uh, my example to illustrate that is uh, there's a hall on the top floor, it's F Hall, that used to uh, sustain eight residents. That's now an office. And they have a bottom floor next to admissions, which used to house four residents. That is now part of probation. Uh, all of the halls that used to sustain 16 residents uh, are, are less two halls because they have offices, so now they only hold 14. So when a resident comes in from the street from being arrested for whatever alleged crime, they're taken to a hall called J Hall. They're, they're not differentiated by age. They're just brought into that hall. So most of the time, those kids go back out to court. But in my work experience, um, a lot of things can happen very quickly and I can't, I don't have enough time to give you all the detail, so I'm just going to just close with that and I'm willing to ask, answer any questions that you have. Let me do two things for you, this, so you can know who the two gentlemen are sitting here. Uh, the one on my left is Alex Parker. He's a grievance rep for the union, but he was a juvenile counselor and the tour commander for over 25 years. Over 25 years. The gentleman on the right is Derek Robinson. He actually is our vice president of grievances and legislation. He also was a juvenile counselor and tour commander for over 25 years. Okay, so we want to share that with you. Also, I want to say to you, we do have a concern. I'm glad you asked questions about commingling, because we have a concern about that. Okay, it is our position that, um, that you need to be conscious of that, and they need to, where possible, at some point, maybe have two different facilities, because okay, this is going to be a challenge for them on the commingling issue. And so we share that concern, but we're prepared to work with the agency to see how they work it out. And thank you again. Yeah, may I just say one other thing? This is in regards to those three um, ideas that I brought forth to you. I'm going to go with the, the gang violence thing, the zero tolerance on gang activity. 95% of the physical altercations that transpire, 90, it's, it's around that. Hmm. And, and you have to be what I would call a seasoned counselor, not a tenure counselor. Tenure is how much time. You have to be a seasoned counselor to understand the jargon, you know, t terms, rocking you to sleep. You know, you, you think it's rocking you to sleep, but rocking you to sleep, for example, is they'll friend a kid. They'll play cards with him. They'll sit in a the classroom. 
So you're looking at the least thing that you imagine is that they're going to bop this kid up the third period or second period. So, you know, that's, that's some of the stuff you have to deal with. There's the contraband issue. And the deterrents that are in place now, with the statistics, if you just look at the archives outside of the, the count has gone down, the, the, the residents don't fear that if they want to punch somebody, if they want to tear the phone off, if they want to throw urine, they, 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 you get the maximum is called zeroed out. That means you offer the program for seven to 10 days. And in their mind, they'll just get back on the program in seven to 10 days. Hmm. So thank you. Thank you. So uh, Councilman Barron has a question. I have a few questions. Follow. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I have a question about the SCM, the Safe Crisis Management. Could you give me some information about what that is and what that, how that works? Yes, thank you, Councilwoman. Um, Safe Crisis Management is a behavioral modification program uh, that uses the least amount of physical restraint possible. So for example, if a resident is be misbehaving, uh, not paying attention, uh, you're supposed to use your counseling techniques uh, as opposed to physically restrain the kid. The physical restraint is the last resort. Okay. So you will practice something called ignoring. You will ignore the behavior uh, until the behavior cannot, can, can, uh, can no longer be ignored. And then you may uh, tap out to another experienced counselor and they may try to reach that child at that child's level. You may call in supervision, you may call uh, mental health to possibly uh, see the resident to try to de-escalate the situation before actually getting to a physical restraint with the child. But if it comes to a physical restraint, there are a number of physical uh, moves that you would make uh, with your partner or by yourself to restrain the child without help hurting the child. Good, thank you. And I just want to say I appreciate the hard work. I know it's a very challenging environment, very difficult situation. Um, I can only imagine, you know, the day-to-day, moment-to-moment inter interactions that occur, and we know that we certainly have to do better with the uh, addressing the mental health issues of those students who are in of those children who are in the system. Uh, also, with the uh, safe crisis management, uh, there are certain things that it does not do. Safe crisis management does not teach you what to do in terms of restraining a resident that is overpowering you, much stronger than you. Because after the initial move that safe crisis management teaches, once you miss that, if the resident is stronger than you, now the, your, your face is totally right in the kid's fist. <laughs> um, then it becomes you know, pretty much fighting for your life if the kid is stronger than you. It does not teach you what to do when you're trying to restrain a big, tall resident, because they have plenty of them, such as myself, with a smaller staff. It does not teach you what to do when there's a gang assault and you're on an eight-man hall, because the ratio in the, uh, the facilities are one staff to every eight residents. What do you do when there's eight residents gang assaulting another member? So this, just to piggyback off of what uh, Mr. Parker was saying, is certain things that the SEM does not do. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you so much, Councilmember Barron. So let me ask a question. What should be the ratio? Should it stay at 1 to 8? Should it be 2 to 8? What do you suggest? Uh, most definitely have to lower the numbers. Because the bottom line is the juvenile counselors today, and we, we're talking about managing 25 kids in one facility, opposed to when we were there, it was 136 kids. We're having problems managing 25 kids at a uh, one to eight ratio. So that ratio would most definitely uh, be more effective if it was uh, maybe one to four. One to four, yeah. Well, let me also respond to that too. Also, I want to thank Commissioner Franco because he says they need 300 counselors. And we agree almost. We think they need 500 counselors. Okay? And there are going to be some instances where you may need four to four ratio in order to gain control of that, of that dorm, of that residence. So the state's recommended is one, to, is one to eight, but nothing prevents the city, nothing prevents administration other than budget, maybe budget concerns, to increasing that number. And they've tried. The question is retention. 
The question is worker safety. And the question was support for these workers. So what happens, I'm curious, what happens, this sounds supervising eight kids, four kids, jump me, the, who comes to my rescue there? Special officer. Can you repeat the question again, please? So let's suppose I'm supervising eight youth and I'm assaulted by four youth, let's say gang related, they say we had it with you, they jumped me, they're fighting me, uh, who comes to my rescue? Uh, in, re in regards to that question, what would happen is that uh, you, you, f you have a telephone and you have a radio, but a, the immediate response is self-preservation. Right. So the, the SCM goes out the window. You, you, you have to figure out a way to um, ward them off to the best of your ability for self-preservation purposes. You're going to radio for what they have special officers that are not next door. That means there's going to be some time before they get to you along with supervision. So pretty much it's self-preservation. I mean, you know, and you have to be mindful of if you don't execute the SEM and your self-preservation kicks in, you, you have to do whatever it takes. You, you'll be held accountable and as far as child abuse allegation because you didn't stay within the protocol at FCM. So do you have, do you have somebody watching uh, in the cameras 24-7 so if there's an altercation, no, they come to your rescue? Yes, special, special officers. But, but, but it, no, it, it varies, though, because in control they have cameras, but it's not always on every single hall. It's not in every area where sometimes it could be in a cafeteria. I mean, it can vary, but you never know when things are going to happen like so that. So there are areas that are not covered by cameras. They all have cameras, but as far as someone visually looking at every single area at right. the same time, no. Okay. That's good to know. Uh, you were going to? No. Okay. So great. The, the other question I was going to ask you, what percentage of the young people and uh, Horizon and Crossroads, uh, do you estimate involving gangs right now? Yes. Mm -hmm. 90. 90%. For sure. 90. Now, I won't say for sure, but a great deal because when residents come in, like new residents come in, the, the seasoned residents, the two questions that they ask them is where they live at and the term what they're jacking. What they're jacking is what you're representing as far as a gang. Mm -hmm. So every, most of those residents say, I'm from the Bronx, I'm jacking YB, YG, you know, Crip, Blood, you know what I mean? And, and, and determine, based on that answer, is whether you're gonna be either accepted by what you are, or they're gonna be like, oh, you jacking Crip? Oh, okay. You know what I mean? And they're not going to tell you they're going to get you. You know, that's that rocking you to the sleep thing. They'll, they'll play along. So it's very, very, you, you, you fatigue on overtime, but you got to be alert at all times. Uh, two more quick questions. Um, excuse uh, well, me, Councilman. Um, yes. To, to further expound on that, it, it kind of even goes back to this, this, this level of classification. So if you, if you have an, a housing area where the, uh, there's a predominant gang, in that housing area, okay, you're not going to put a neutral resident or a resident who is from a rival gang in that house. So it kind of throws classification out the door. And if you add 16 and 17 year old Rikers Island mentality on top of this and not do it correctly, you can just imagine a level of violence and this whole concept of raise the age, this whole concept of trying to save young people goes right out the door. We actually create an environment in which we breed future gang members. Hmm. So I'm looking forward to, uh, to hear uh, the results of the meeting you will be having in the near future and hopefully they, they will be ongoing uh, to make sure that we have the best possible practices in light of the fact that we're getting ready to embark on a scenario that we have never had, 16, 17 year olds um, and in a youth detention uh, facility. The last question I was gonna ask you was, what do you uh, suggest should be, uh, and I don't know if you're at liberty to, to answer this, but a, a salary uh, that they feel they're being properly compensated that would attract the best possible 
uh, pool of counselors and we'll be able to sustain them. So I don't have a, I don't have a number. I don't negotiate public like that anyway. Uh, but we do know that the salary we have is inadequate to do it. Uh, it's inadequate for the population that we service now. And to the agency's credit, we've had some discussions about that. We, we didn't make a deal, but we have some discussions about That's that. Good. But we think we need to increase it, okay, in order to get uh, the crowd of people that you want to do this job and have an incentive to stay. Okay. Well, thank you so much. Thank you, I appreciate, appreciate all of the hard work, uh, the daily work uh, that you are providing, and looking forward to future discussions. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Have a great day. With that, um, we're going to call for the next panel, uh, Elizabeth Powers from Children Defense Fund, Kate Rubin from Youth Represent, Christy Belk, and Mark. Marsha or Marha Thurman, the New York uh, Legal Aid Society, and Marta Feynman from the Legal Aid Society. Great, it's good to see everyone. Uh, you may begin as soon as you're ready. I, I can't hear you, uh, but let me just mention, uh, was that we'll, we'll, we'll put you in a three minute clock, but you know I'm gonna have questions, so we'll be able to have a, a dialogue. Great, thank you. Thank you. My name is Beth Powers. I'm the Director of Youth Justice at the Children's Defense Fund New York. Thank you, Chair Cabrera and members of the City Council Committee on Juvenile Justice for this opportunity to testify today. The Children's Defense Fund New York co-leads the Raise the Age New York campaign, a public education campaign which helped to bring awareness to the need to raise the age in New York State. We continue to advocate to ensure that the law is successfully implemented, advocating for appropriate planning and allocation of funding to ensure all jurisdictions around the state are able to appropriately implement the law. Raising the age of criminal responsibility in New York was a long overdue change. Legislation is only one step in ensuring this change impacts young people as intended. The manner in which the law is planned and implemented is critical to ensuring young people benefit to the fullest extent possible. My first comments are in regard to the new specialized secure detention for adolescent offenders. It's critical for the success of Raised the Age to be seen that these facilities are designed and operated as youth facilities under a youth justice model and not as 16 and 17 year olds are currently detained in facilities segregated for youth but under an adult correctional model. It's critical that all policies and practices in the new facility mirror those currently used for youth and not adult correctional practices. Chemical agents or pepper spray are an example of tools which are used by DOC but not by ACS against adolescents and should not be replicated as practice in these new facilities. The inadequate treatment of adolescents at Rikers Island has been documented over the years. The most recent report of the independent court appointed monitor in Nunez versus the City of New York from October of this year continues to highlight unacceptable conditions for youth that the monitors call serious and problematic issues involving staff use of force. It is critical that ACS and DOC make every effort possible to ensure that the culture and mistreatment of youth that has occurred at Rikers is not carried over into the new facilities. Staff selected to work in new facilities should be deemed appropriate to work with youth from those with expertise serving youth, and staff transitioning from working in adult correction should be vetted and thoroughly trained in the different practices, policies, and culture that is expected in the new youth facility. DOC has made strides to increase positive programming for adolescents at Rikers. The should, city should make efforts to ensure that all programming offered to adolescents now is available in the new setting to avoid un any unintentional loss of access to programming. In addition to ensuring that the new facilities are designed, operated, and regulated as youth justice facilities and not adult correctional settings, ACS must make strides to ensure that the experiences of youth currently in their care is not negatively impacted as Raise the Age is implemented. ACS must take steps to ensure that if space currently occupied by youth awaiting juvenile delinquency and juvenile offender cases is utilized to house, house youth charged as adolescent offenders, that this increase in population and decrease in free space does not in any way negatively impact youth currently in the facilities. ACS has in place model practices and policies, uh, I'm sorry, policies and, and best practice guidance for the treatment of LGBTQ youth in their care. 
Emphasis is placed by ACS in its policies regarding LGBTQ youth on respecting youth and ensuring that when placed out of home, they are in affirming placements. Of particular note are housing practices for placement of transgender youth, which are significantly significantly stronger for ACS than DOC, and the new facility should follow ACS's policies and practices of placing transgender youth based on their gender identity, that is the preference of the young person. While ACS is curr currently serves youth age 16 and up, they will experience an increase in older youth once raised the age is in effect. ACS needs to ensure it is prepared to meet the needs of older youth. Such accommod accommodations must include all steps along the justice continuum, from respite and front-end services, detention and close to home, and consideration for aftercare, such as educational, vocational needs, health and mental health, housing needs, and family dynamics. Raise the Age is an opportunity to genuinely change the experience of detained youth, and we're grateful for the Council for no, monitoring implementation. Go ahead. Go ahead. Okay. Uh, my last sentence. We encourage the Council to continue oversight to ensure the laws implemented and intended to ensure young people are treated in age-appropriate ways that best serve youth and communities. Wow, you read that really fast and really good. <laughs> Thank you. Thank Thanks. you. Great job. Um, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Kate Rubin. I'm the Director of Policy at Youth Represent. Um, we provide legal services to justice-involved youth, uh, 25 and, uh, under 25. Uh, thank you, Chair Cabrera, and to the committee uh, for holding the hearing and for the opportunity to testify and for your years of support for Raise the Age. Um, I've submitted more detailed written comments, so I'll just summarize three points. First, echoing Beth and I think other colleagues, emphasizing that any facility used for detention or placement of youth under 18, regardless of offense charged and venue prosecuted, must be a youth facility. And specifically, this means that any specialized secure juvenile detention Facility for older youth described in the Raise the Age legislation must be envisioned, managed, and staffed as a juvenile facility. We understand that the city has practical concerns, but our position is that 16 and 17 year olds are children. They should not now be under supervision of DOC correction officers, and they should not be under supervision of DOC correction officers a year from now. Um, second, the primary purpose of these facilities must be to prepare adolescents for successful reentry into the community. Reentry services should be tailored to the needs of older youth um, as they come into the uh, to ACS's care, and they need to start at intake and continue into communities. Especially for older youth, these services must include civil legal services, uh, like rap sheet review, which we provide at Youth Represent. In the past five years at Youth Represent, we have identified and corrected almost 800 errors on kids' rap sheets. Um, we think that number will go up when Raise the Age goes into effect, and there are hundreds of kids getting transferred from adult court uh, into the family court. Um, and that rap sheet review and counseling doesn't just prepare youth for employment and education, but it serves as a diagnostic tool where we can identify other legal issues, anything from uh, public housing termination eviction to criminal justice debt that are uh, cut off critical opportunities for youth. And then finally, no matter how youth-centered and reentry focused our facilities are, our goal should always be to keep children out of detention. Um, the administration has really made tremendous strides in this area, as we heard in their testimony, and we commend them for that. But there is a danger now in assuming that this number is as low as it can be. Um, and I say that with full understanding that most of the 16 and 17 year olds currently at Rikers are facing serious charges, um, including violent felony offenses. We work with those young people through the youth reentry network. We understand how complicated many of their situations are. Um, but there's a growing chorus of criminal justice experts who are warning that we won't reverse the trend of mass incarceration unless we reduce the use of incarceration, including for violent felony offenses. Um, it fa incarceration fails to deliver accountability and safety, especially for youth, and there are things that work better. I list a lot of them in my testimony, a few supportive housing with wraparound services, employment programs that provide paid work, as well as career uh, counseling and skills development, mentoring programs that use credible messengers. Um, there is no better place than New York City to provide the innovative model for the country about how we can do better by kids and communities by continuing to reduce youth incarceration even for serious and violent charges. Thank you. Okay. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Christine Bella, and I'm here with Martin Feynman from the Legal Aid Society's Juvenile Rights Practice. And again, thank you for the opportunity to testify today on this important topic. So the Legal Aid Society supports Raise the Age, and we uh, reiterate our call to the city to in, uh, continue to engage in sta the stakeholders in a thorough and transparent process 
to ensure that all policies, including this new classification system that's been um, introduced today and the commingling practice that, practices that will result from this new uh, process. So we want to be at the table um, informing um, the city about how to best proceed with classification and commingling, um, as we understand that, the, that those are both important to maintaining the safety of the youth in the facility. So raise the age. Um, this prohibition um, on 16 and 17 year olds remaining in adult jails and prisons along with the mayor's plan to move youth from Rikers will lead to greater protections and, and better outcomes for incarcerated youth. Youth have a constitutional right to be free from harm while in confinement and as we re repeatedly testified before the council, youth are exposed to significant harms while in custody. And our focus for today's testimony is largely um, to ensure that the safe conditions um, of, com that youth receive safe conditions of confinement while in custody um, and to reiterate, reiterate um, Deputy Commissioner uh, Franco's um, mission to ensure better outcomes for incarcerated youth. So while the legislation does not clearly delineate the role ACS will take in the creation and implementation of the new specialized secure facilities, it is clear that ACS is to be central to the process and they are yet at another critical juncture as they expand their capacity and reach to meet these requirements. We urge the city to extend the ACS DYFJ policies and programming to youth detained in the new specialized secure facilities rather than extend the reach of DOC. Despite um, decades of lawsuits by legal aid and the chronic high rates of violence at the facilities that house teen boys, um, the Department of Corrections has only recently in increased its funding for youth programming and significantly increased staffing for youth and provided for enhanced training for the staff working for youth. We want to acknowledge that DC DOC has made some significant improvements in this area for programming. However, youth under the, in the specialized secure facilities should not be under the care and control of the Department of Corrections. The city must envision a safer, more effective way to care for the custody of teens that are housed in these new facilities. We want to see that um, ACS facilities be duly licensed. We do think that um, affording ACS the flexibility to move JOs and JDs be, from one facility to another is important that that continues. We want youth to be able to remain uh, close to their families and communities and legal teams because access to their supports um, during these crisis periods is very important to them. Um, so we, we see the need for the dual licensing and we see the need for the co-mingling, but the classification system has to be done right. And we are very concerned that the Department of Corrections again could extend its reach. Um, I'll just close, if I may, I urge you to look at the, um, the monitor, the fourth monitor report of the Nunez litigation, which does lay out the current problems that persist at Rikers Island under um, the supervision of the Department of Corrections. I think that's critical um, for anyone involved in this process to take a look at. And we'd like to see the ACS programming, including the Cure Violence programs, continue and be expanded to the Specialized Secure, as well as its other policies for enhanced family engagement and visitation, um, physical restraints and room confinement. Um, these are much more humane <coughs> policies. Um, lastly, we encourage the City Council um, to continue its oversight, and we, we uh, urge more robust oversight of these new facilities as they um, unfold. Good afternoon, my name is Marty Feynman, also from the Legal Aid Society. Um, let me just comment on two or three comments in response to the testimony already rather than some uh, than prepared remarks. One isn't to reiterate something that Christine just said, but uh, perhaps say it more forcefully. Um, we, we're not opposed to commingling. We, we appreciate and recognize the need for some level of commingling, um, but we think it's critical that the Legal Aid Society and other advocates for youth play a role in the classification tool that's developed in order to make a determination as to how best to commingle with youth. Um, representatives of kids who have no financial stake in making those determinations and who work with youth just as the provider agencies do uh, on a day in day out basis. We feel that our contribution and our role is critical um, and we hope that we will be involved in that process as it moves forward from today. Um, we are also concerned in light of the fact that there will be commingling and in light of the fact uh, the facilities that will be used. Um, clearly there is going to be involvement with Department of Corrections staff and and the prospect of kids who up until kids who are classified as juvenile delinquents, people that the Department of Corrections staff has not worked with before. Um, while 
that may not be our ideal. We recognize that that's going to become necessary for quite some time, but we think that that means that there's going to be a tremendous amount of training that's going to need to be done for the Department of Correction staff that is not only been working, well, that up until now has been working with the 16 and 17 year olds, but has no real experience working with youth that are younger than that, but in light of the commingling that will take place, we'll certainly have that opportunity, we'll be in that position. Um, and finally, let me just say that some concerns about the use of Ella McQueen, we recognize that it is a sort of an unfortunate reality that a facility like that needs to be incorporated into um, the detention facilities. Uh, but we have some concerns about whether or not Ella McQueen um, is able, is in a position to be able to, to be able to provide the same range of services um, that uh, Horizon can provide and the Crossroad can provide to youth. Um, it is a much smaller facility. It doesn't have nearly the kind of space. It doesn't have the kind of resources that those other two facilities um, provide. And while there may be a goal that any youth that come through there are only there for a very, very short term, um, depending on what the numbers prove to be once raised the age becomes an effect, there's really no way of knowing exactly how that's going to be utilized. Um, and we do know that it is not the same kind of facility that the other two are. And we had some serious concerns and we feel that it's going to be very important to monitor um, the use of that facility um, and whether or not youth that are there are going to be getting the same range and the same quality of services that they are hopefully getting um, at Horizon and Crossroads. Obviously no youth um, JD, JO, or AO should be in a position where they're not getting at least as good, if not better, services once raised the age is implemented than they were before that. Thank you. Well, thank you so much for that point, because that point has not been brought up uh, during today's hearing. This smaller facility, are they, are, are they going to have the services that come from Carnegie Hall, they come from all the other groups that have been contracted. So it's a smaller facility, meaning, you know, and it's not in Horizon Crossroads that it's going to be a greater expense because it's in a different facility. The economy of scale won't be there. So that's, that's a really good point. I'll, I'll make sure to follow up on that. I uh, wanted to ask you, because uh, you mentioned um, uh, the, we heard the testimony from the administration. There will be 20 months uh, with DLC correction officers really getting involved. Do you think that is a good number? I thought I heard somebody said no October, but if it's not, then you know we don't. I, I, it's no way we're going to get 500 trained, 300 or 500, whatever they're going to end up with counselors. So what are we doing in between? I mean, I, you know, I would suggest that the city takes the position, you know, the, the raise the age proposal that I think we all as advocates and that I believe the city supported would have just raised the age of, of criminal responsibility to 18. And so 16 and 17 year olds, once the law went into effect, would just be treated as youth. And when they were detained, as in lots of other jurisdictions in the country where 16 and 17 year olds are just kids. Um, they would be detained in juvenile facilities. So, I mean, that's the approach that I would suggest that the city take. Um, this has been a long time coming. We've been advocating for this, as you, as you well know, as, uh, better than most. Um, there's been a long time to get people up to speed. 16 and 17 year olds look maybe you know, intimidating compared to 14 and 15 year olds, but they are kids. <laughs> um, and ACS has, you know, they are the experts in youth development. They know how to work with young people. So it's our position that these kids should become the responsibility of ACS, not DOC, which is, which is the legislative proposal that I think we all, you know, supported and that didn't pass, uh, you know, because of, because the legislation that passed was a a product of compromise in our state legislature. I don't think that it would, it, you know, if, if the city could pass its own laws, I don't think it's the, the law that this body would have passed. I agree with that. Um, I, I understand the, the constraints that they're under, and I um, appreciate all of Deputy Commissioner Franco's comments about needing to make changes to make the position um, appealing and make necessary changes given what an incredibly difficult job it is. Um, 
That said, our biggest fear is that if we are moving young people off of Rikers, which is such a huge success, something we've fought for for so long, and have them continue to be under the Department of Correction, um, that we risk shifting that culture and shifting a lot of the conditions that have existed to another, a, di a different building. Um, and so while I, I understand the difficulty in, in hiring that number of staff and recruiting that number, I think all efforts should be made in that year to, to hire as many people as possible that want to go into serving youth. It's a, it's a very different structure and mindset and it isn't, um, a, a, it shouldn't be a correctional setting. So that's, it, it's a major concern of ours. Yeah, I just see uh, different forces at work here, and I, I agree with you 100%. Uh, the challenge here is the state. The state has dragged their feet, they uh, delayed everyone uh, with their strategies and implementation, execution, and therefore we have even began with recruitment. I mean, we're not even at the training level. It's just basic recruitment, and I, Honestly, I don't think they're going to have it all ready for uh, by October. Um, that's, you know, right. I'm usually a very optimistic kind of a person, <laughs> but I'm also pragmatic and realistic and like to deal with facts. Uh, so I guess the next best thing that I think I, I heard is what do we do? and that plan B and that transition to make sure, I heard you mention the training, I think that's uh, definitely uh, vital. You mentioned my last question here is relating uh, to classification. Do you have um, uh, any suggestion of what those classifications and the variables involve criteria? Because I haven't heard much of the specifics today regarding that. Well, no, I, I don't think and I, I don't fault anybody for this. I don't think we've heard any specifics, and today is the first that we've heard um, about the use of a cl new classification tool for purposes of commingling in a way that is different than what the uh, statute has set forth. Um, and like I said, we're, we're in support of that. Um, we don't think that youth should be um, defined strictly by whether they're an AO, JO, or JD for deciding what are the most appropriate services and in what connection with each other those services should be provided. Um, I, I, I would love to be able to respond to that question with details, but I, I think that it really is something that requires a great deal of thought. Um, I don't know whether the classifications, whether we're strictly, whether we're talking about separate classifications within AOs, within JDs, within JOs, um, mm. um, school level, age level, size level, maturity level, um, gang involvement or not gang involvement, you know, factors like that. I can imagine a range of factors mm. that one might want to take into consideration. Um, at the same point in time, I think that all those factors need to be considered carefully um, in creating a tool. You know, we have a tool, uh, the risk assessment instrument that's used for making the determination um, in family court as to whether or not a youth should be detained. And there is a tremendous amount of research and empirical data that went into the creation of that tool. Um, you know, we are stuck, uh, it's been said over and over and over again by yourself, Mr. Chairman, and by other people, um, someone from correction, or from, um, mm -hmm. not corrections, I'm sorry, but you know, from uh, the union said a few moments ago that if you're going to do something like this, which is a great thing to do, do it right. You know, mm. don't rush it through. Uh, we are, unfortunately, because the state, as you've so aptly indicated, has dragged its heels, we are in a position between a rock and a hard place, you know, of needing to accomplish something that we all agree needs to be accomplished, but um, being having one hand tied behind our backs because the state is not being very forthcoming in, in issuing regulations and talking about uh, what kinds of resources and funding is going to be available to do this, and we have to do the best that can be done, everybody has to do the best that can be done under those circumstances so that this population can be served the best that it possibly can be. Um, everything should be expedited. Um, like I said, I, I, I do think it's critical to have us involved in developing those tools, and I do think that um, since having Department of Corrections staff is going to be a critical piece of this, that we do everything possible to make sure 
that they are trained properly to deal with the population that they're going to be deal with, dealing with, which they haven't necessarily dealt with in the past. Well, yes. No, oh. I'm sorry. Okay, so I want to thank you uh, for Can coming. Have, but you're going to. You I have one yeah, more go comment go about go the go DOC. You waited this question, long. Just oh. because I. I um, and I say this with, you know, a huge amount of respect for the city and just the tremendous undertaking that this is. Um, but I was thinking, as, as Marty and Christine were talking about, you know, over the past few years, the council and the city have provided huge new funding streams for legal services, which have been incredible. And they forced legal services providers to staff up very, very quickly and do, you know, whether it's uh, housing eviction or detained deportation defense, take on hundreds of new cases in a short amount of time with you know, very little uh, existing, even institutional knowledge, little in staff capacity. And I'm not at all equating that work. I actually think the work that, um, that juvenile justice counselors do is harder than the work that legal services lawyers do. Um, and so I'm not equating those two things, but I am saying that there are many examples where new funding streams exist, are, are created, or laws change. And, you know, there's a requirement to staff up quickly to recruit a lot of new uh, employees and to train them, there's almost a year before next October. I mean, I think the city can do it. I've seen other agencies do it. And I think that to, st to start with the premise that we're going to bring in DOC for two years, you know, without, and, you know, and at the end of that, a possibility of them continuing and not just an advisory, but also operational capacity, I think is starting from the wrong premise. If mm. a year from now we haven't been able to you know, we're not able to staff facilities, then there's a conversation about what to do as a stopgap measure. But I don't see why that's the starting point. And just one, one last point about um, making the role, the, the positions more appealing and attractive. And I think that is something that, um, you know, the city needs to make those, um, make that available through DCAS and OMB. And that is a necessary step to then inform the recruitment, to then inform the training. So that has to be done. Uh, I think there's a real urgency there. I think once you allow DOC into the facilities with, for whatever the um, initial agreement is, whether it's 20 months or 24 months, um, we will be in a situation where we, it's likely to be extended. They will take control over the facilities um, and have a greater reach. So uh, I'd like to see some kind of written agreement if this we do wind up on October 1st with DOC in place that this be embodied in some sort of MOU where it's time limited and revisited and not just sort of allowed to continue or drift. Uh, so we personally. need to keep them on a very, um, I think, um, tight timeline with regard to that and their role in, in working in these facilities. I personally believe that the starting pay for that job should be 50000 I mean, it's just the level of intensity. I, I you know, I, in my other life, I did counseling. I'm, I'm a licensed mental health counselor. I'm a doctor in counseling. I taught at a university. And when I see the affect, when I see uh, the level of pressure that they're working on, and the level of discussion I have with them, they, they has, it has to be, there has to be some kind of a compensation for that that they could use in their own private line. When you have more money, you could do other things that will help you depressurize. Yeah. Um, and so, and then we wouldn't have such a high level of, you know, of counselors are quitting. Thank you so much for what you Thank do. You. What you do really, really matters to the young people, and I'm looking forward to you continue being a voice, especially when it comes to the classification and the other issues that are going to be coming up in this next uh, 12, well, eight months uh, coming up, nine months. Thank, Thank, Thank you, you so much. And uh, okay, uh, we have. Penny Fujiko Wilkenot from the Prosper Hill Foundation, Cody Novak from the Prosper Hill Foundation, Julie Peterson from Pickerton Foundation, uh, Grant Coles from Citizens Community for Children, uh, Castro, Gisea Castro, I believe that's what I'm reading here, Exalt Youth. Uh, and Christine Pahigian, or Pahigian, Pahigian Friends of Islands Academy.
Thank you for waiting. I know many of you have been waiting uh, for a long time. Um, but uh, I know what you have to share uh, is important, so I'm all ears. Thank you so much. Whoever wants to begin first. You're all so nice. You're all waiting each other. I'll start. <laughs> Thank you. Um, my name is Julie Peterson. I'm a senior program officer at the Pinkerton Foundation and also the co-chair of the New York Youth Justice Initiative, which is a group of funders interested in youth justice. The Pinkerton Foundation funds programs for young people in New York City, hundreds of after-school science, art, and sports programs. We also focus on programs for young people involved in the justice and the child welfare systems. I applaud New York's efforts to raise the age of criminal court jurisdiction, and I'm thrilled that 16 and 17 year olds will be moved off of Rikers Island by October 2018. I bring my voice to bear today in the hope that New York City will take this moment of reform to further improve youth justice. It's imperative as the age is raised to support transformative programming for young adults both within and outside of incarcerative settings. In the past few years, ACS, DOC, DOP, and DYCD have made efforts to improve programming for justice-involved young people. The Pinkerton Foundation supports many of these programs. As the age is raised, the city must support increased programming for the 16 and 17-year-olds who will be at the ACS facilities and continue to support robust programming for the 18 to 24-year-olds in DOC and DOP custody. Young adults in the justice system need programming that provides hope, opportunity, and a positive sense of community. New York City is rich in quality programs. As a funder, I see the powerful work that these programs do, and I watch as court-involved young people are engaged and inspired to serve others. Transformative group-based mentoring using paid, credible messenger mentors is a model that works. The city is already supporting two such programs, Arches and Next Steps for Youth on Probation and in Public Housing. Credible messengers, in this case men and women who have their own histories of justice involvement, um, run groups for young adults and collectively, they learn principles of cognitive behavioral therapy, restorative practice, trauma-informed care, and adolescent development. Mentors and peers create personal and professional networks of support. In turn, these networks accelerate professional development and offer encouragement during the crises that come from living in impoverished neighborhoods. Credible messenger mentoring is effective in incarcerative settings as well, helping to mitigate the tension and trauma of custody and providing a space where caring and healing can happen. These programs work. This should not come as a surprise. They engage young adults, they develop and support mentors, and they improve and often transform the culture of agencies responsible for the well-being of these cities' most vulnerable young people. Thank you. Next. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Cody Novak, and I'm here representing the Prospect Hill Foundation. The Prospect Hill Foundation is a New York-based philanthropy founded by the Beinecke family more than 50 years ago. Uh, since 2009, recognizing the unique opportunity in New York State for systems transformation, we invested in the movements to establish close to home, to raise the age of criminal responsibility, and to promote community-based models that present non-incarceration strategies. We promote the leadership of formerly incarcerated youth, their families, and a concept of justice that advances rehabilitation. As New York City implements new raise the age policies, we recognize this extraordinary moment in our city's history. 
At this time, we want to emphasize the importance of maintaining the focus on youth as children, children who are developing into adults. We have three points today. First, as the city creates new policies for 16 to 17 year old children, we must never forget the word children. We implore ACS and city policymakers to consider their own children and children they know and love. Would you want your own child to be treated this way? Would this be the best program for your child? The best path forward for a 16 to 17 year old is one, not fo is one focused on recovery, not punishment. Our second point is that we support ACS's partnerships with community organizations and encourage even further community reinvestment. There should be robust funding of community programs. The Prospect Hill Foundation is proud, to, is, is proud of the incredibly effective and successful organizations that it has funded, including Center for New Leadership on Urban Solutions, Exalt Youth, Community Connections for Youth, Drama Club, Young New Yorkers, Lineage Project, and the Youth Speakers, in, Youth Speakers Institute at Youth Represent. These groups illuminate a new vision of youth justice. They are national models and resources that ACS, the City Council, and the de Blasio administration should take advantage of as the city plans for Raise the Age. DYFJ should integrate the wisdom and experience of all these programs into its new policies. We believe the city must make new funds available through ACS, DOE, and DYCD to expand programs for youth. We challenge the city to create a new multi-million dollar initiative over the next five to ten years for new contracts with community providers to benefit youth. Finally, we commend the City Council for organizing this hearing and expect you to use your power to exercise continued oversight on Raise the Age planning and implementation. We recommend that this committee convene the City, DYFJ, DOA, DOE, and DYCD in January or February 2018 to consult with community-based organizations on Raise the Age. We look forward to more hearings scheduled on a regular basis to facilitate open dialogue. The Prospect Hill Foundation is fully committed to supporting the city's efforts to implement Raise the, implement Raise the Age and will continue to fund advocacy and community-based alternatives, ensuring that children are given not a cell, but a way forward to healthy and productive lives. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Giselle Castro. I'm the Executive Director of Exalt, Exalt Youth. Um, thank you, Chair Cabrera and the staff, and thank you for the opportunity to speak under, for the Juvenile Justice Committee regarding the implementation of Raise the Age legislation. Exalt is a nonprofit organization that we work with young people who are court involved ages 15 to 19. We're the only organization in New York City that works with young people on a voluntary basis as opposed to compliance. I want to begin by thanking um, all of the council members, the mayor's office, the administration for children's services, and their sister agencies for their collaborative work in preparing for implementing the initial requirements of Race the Age legislation by October 1st, 2018. And I also want to thank the Division of Youth and Family Justice for their internal work with their key ACS division in identifying ACS specific implementation actions. As an, av as an advocate, I understand the challenges that come with the new le legislation, including uncertainty surrounding part of this particular one, as well as the immense work that must be done in effectively communicating priorities and plan with states and oversight bodies. How however, these challenges will not, must not prevent the effort and comprehensive approach to this legislation. This is why our conversation today is very important. At Exalt, we know that the first priority to any legislation affecting our young people must come with appropriate investments in supportive programs and opportunities. Our model has shown how safe and open validating spaces um, can change the trajectory of many young people and in turn reduce the criminal activity among teenagers. In the last fiscal year, over 65% of our youth served by Exalt served serious life altering charges, including felonies offenses. The intersection of justice, involvement, and educations are always intertwined, as less than a quarter of our young people who come through our doors are either in school or on track to graduate high school. After participating in our program, less than 5% of our young people are reconvicted of a crime, and more than 95% are, remain enrolled in school. Our outcome shows that when young people are given the individual agency to participate in their future and choose their path toward success, our schools, community become safer. 
I just want to stop there because I'm being very mindful of time. But thank you so much for the work. And I want to just, you know, say that in terms of our organization, you know, we're always, you know, thinking through how to best support the young people who are here in New York City. And it is a goal and hopefully, um, you know, an opportunity for us to participate in ensuring that this is a successful implementation process. Thank you so much. Good shit. Here, just a little. So my glasses just broke, so I get an extra 15 seconds because I have to hold them. <laughs> oh, goodness. Um, Chairman Cabrera and members of the committee, thank you for the opportunity to address you. My name is Christine Pegan, and I serve as the executive director of Friends of Island Academy. Friends is a nonprofit organization based in central Harlem, which was founded in 1990 on the school floors of Rikers Island. At that time, the city held about 23,000 people per night on Rikers, out of which about 3,500 were adolescents 16, 17, and 18. Friends was created 28 years ago specifically to address the transitional and post-release support needs of young people on Rikers that was defined back then as kids 16 to 18. That was the line in the sand at that time, for whom neither discharge planning nor aftercare support services existed. It's always felt to me that the confluence of New York's justice system of laws, policies, rules, and practices are nowhere more complex than when you view them through the lens of the custody of young people between the ages of 13 and 18. Many of those laws and practices, such as the passage of the J.O. law in 1979, driven by the headlines in an election year, or the notion of, of super predators, a term coined by a Princeton criminologist in the early 90s, resulted in driving up detention for kids, both locally and nationally, in a massive way. Um, ultimately, the apocalypse didn't come. Professor DeLulio recanted and apologized, but the damage was done both locally and nationally. We're now on the other side of that mountain, and an extraordinary opportunity exists in which New York City can continue to provide the kind of leadership that has resulted in reducing arrests, in reducing crime, and in simultaneously reducing the average daily population of kids in custody. The, oh, the collective focus of that leadership now needs to turn, on, turn to triggering effective outcomes beginning inside custody. I just, I know my time is up, so I'm gonna put this away and just draw your attention to the last page. Um, our organization started something 15 months ago uh, known as the Youth Reentry Network. It's the first time that we were publicly funded by the Department of Correction, by any public source, to, to scale up the model, which begins inside custody from admission, is triggered by admission, and serves like a cantilever in a house, so that the longer and the deeper the span is inside, the greater strength is the structure on the outside. And we leverage those relationships and work with young people inside and out. We have started, we started a year ago working with exclusively the 16 and 17 year olds on Rikers, who are all currently housed together right now in one building on Rikers. And since that time, approximately, um, I have these numbers in here, but I don't want to take any more time. The point is we're working with about 500 young people outside who are that age, who we first met inside, who we got to know better while they were inside, and who ultimately are working with us on the outside. I urge the committee, the city, to look to this very massive wealth of partners, of, of people who do this work, because they are out there in this city, and leverage that as part of what becomes the city's plan. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Grant Coles. I'm the Senior Policy Associate for Youth Justice at Citizens Committee for Children. CCC is an independent, multi-issue child advocacy organization dedicated to ensuring that every New York child is healthy, housed, educated, and safe. CCC is grateful to the City Council and this committee for your long-term support and efforts to raise the age of criminal responsibility from 16 to 18. Now the legislation is finally the law and needs to be implemented and implemented well. Nearly every other state uses a juvenile justice system for 16 and 17 year olds and CCC is confident that New York can also be successful. Our written testimony provides a lot of background and other uh, points that we want to highlight for the council, but I will keep it to summarize three quick points. First, for uh, detention, um, throughout the non-secure, secure, and specialized secure facilities for older youth, um, there will be a need for new capacity, policies, procedures, and staff training that ensures these 16 and 17 year old youth are provided with a youth-centered rehabilitation model as opposed to an adult correctional model. Second, 
um, the importance of diversion and adjustment. Um, the adjustment is a hallmark of the juvenile justice system process, and this opportunity must be appropriately available for 16 and 17 year olds. Probation will thus need the additional capacity and resources to provide these diversion opportunities to 16 and 17 year olds. And finally, the importance of community-based services. As my colleagues up, up here have, have mentioned just now, um, these services are a hallmark of why the juvenile justice system is successful. Um, specifically, alternative detention and alternative deplacement programs are key elements that make that allow the youth, youth success, and these must be available. Um, and uh, we'll also. I, uh, CCC is highly appreciative of the work already being done by the city um, and has been the leadership shown in pulling together all the stakeholders. Um, and CCC is committed to uh, working together with the city and the state to ensure that funding is available and that the implementation process um, continues uh, and goes well. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, I'm curious to know, please remind me, how many of your organizations are and nonprofits are working right now with the 16 and 17 year olds uh, at Rikers? One, two, three, four. So uh, out of your organizations, how many of you had an opportunity to speak with ACS during this transition as to whether the programming that you have taking place in, in Rikers Island with a 16, 17 year old, uh, is that gonna be transferred to detention centers? Is that gonna be expanded with the other youth? What about the other nonprofits that are already there? Um, if you could give me uh, a little indication where we at in the radar. Thank you. In our particular case, um, our organization is currently funded through a demonstration contract through the New York City Department of Correction over a three-year period. About 25% of the funds also allow for partners. Uh, right now we're working with 21 different partners who are also private nonprofits through this thing that we refer to as a network. Our our hope is, and we've had some preliminary discussions, but, but certainly not one that I could sit here and say publicly, yes, of course. If someone asks us, um, and everyone always asks us, what are you going to do when the kids leave Rikers? My answer is always, whatever building they're in and whoever's jurisdiction they're in, that's where we will be and that's where we will go. But and my, my question hope is we is, can retain the scale. With, for example, your situation, yeah. DLC funds you. Now that they're going to be on their ACS, they're going to the detention center, will they continue that level of funding? There are, I suppose there are a number of different ways it could go. One could be that DOC transfers those funds to ACS for the purpose of continuing it. Uh, the worst case is DOC says see ya, and that's the end of that story, which would really be not a smart thing to do. I, I mean, yeah, that would be tragic. Um, it would be bad. So uh, there are different mechanisms, and I think fundamentally the issue will be to see what aspects of what we do are easily transferable, and certainly the work that, that is happening now with our partners and us, specifically with the 16s and 17s, um, which essentially is a... It's a very comprehensive system of aftercare triggered by admission. So that translates whatever building you happen to, to put a kid in. But uh, is it safe mm. for me to say that at this point you're not getting a whole lot of direction on uh, any information regarding how the transition is going to happen regarding funding? I, I, for two reasons. It's fair to your organization. You know, you, the funding is, you can't do anything without funding. Uh, it was very difficult to do things without funding, let me put it this way, in a sustainable way. Uh, and you have employees as well. Uh, so we I, need I just, a better package. What was that? We need a better package, too. Yes, indeed. <laughs> so I, I'm just curious as to what level of information are you getting as, during this transition time? Because really, if indeed they are going to get there by October or next year, if indeed, uh, we should be having that level of discussion now because it's fair to your organizations to be able to prepare either way uh, it, it goes. So it's safe for me to say that there hasn't been a lot of information coming your way? 
I, I, I would say that there is information, and I would, um, in terms of our organization, we serve the spectrum, you know, which is young people who are ages 15 to 19. Um, we have some young people who are released from Rikers Island. Uh, we're probably one of the few organizations that's funded you know, privately, you know, as, um, you know, the Pinkerton, through the Pinkerton Foundation, through the Prospect Hill. We have been um, working with young people who are coming in from ACS particularly um, the Close to Home initiative, but in terms of you know, just thinking and planning for this actual transition, um, I would say that there are opportunities and real opportunities for us you know, to really collaborate. Um, so there has been some um, collaboration, but not specifically to um, this you know, initiative. So, yes. And let me add as a funder of many of these programs that I can't see that there won't be more money required for programming. There's many providers that are providing programming for kids today in Horizons and Crossroad and for young people in the Department of Correction. One thing I'm very afraid of is that all that money is going to shift to providing programs for the 16 and 17 year olds wherever they are and the 18 to 24 year olds at Rikers who are also in desperate need of programming and are now benefiting from an influx in programming money to the Department of Corrections are going to get lost in the sauce and they need programming just as much as the 16 and 17 year olds are and logistically getting to Rikers to deliver programming is a huge hurdle. It's it's also significantly hard to get to Crossroads and Horizon, but a little bit easier. And so you can't just expect organizations for the same amount of money to be running programs in both, in, in, in three different, you know, locations. You're going to have to, you're going to have to figure that out. Well, I, I want to encourage you that as soon as we're going to, to transition ourselves right here in the council, uh, in terms of who's going to chair what, uh, well, I guess we'll find out in the next few weeks um, or sooner. And I want to encourage you to sit down quickly with whosoever is going to be overseeing this committee and um, the and I'm I'll, I'll stay around one way or another. I'm staying around. Uh, too much work uh, that I put in for me not to be around, but. Uh, also, whoever is going to be overseeing corrections, uh, DLC. Uh, so this level of uh, discussion uh, does not go by the wayside, and we could be attentive uh, in this transition so we don't have the 18 and 24-year-olds, which some of the 16 and 17-year-olds, unfortunately, might end up in that group later on. and. They're, they'll benefit in the detention center, and if, unfortunately, some of them, we know they're going to come back into the system. We want to make sure that, you know, that we have the right programming for them. My last question uh, for you is, is there anything that you heard today uh, that you said, and I wish I could say this, and I wish we would do this instead? I mean, the thing that I heard today that scared me, and it was it was uh, mentioned on the panel before us, was the idea of using Department of Corrections officers in ACS facilities to take care of. And um, I see the I see your friends from legal yeah. over there nodding. Uh, you got a you got a fan club over there too. I I just can't think that's the right thing to do. Okay. Mine was a more visceral one, which is that we, you know, we have always in New York drawn these lines in the sand, A-O, J-O, this O, that O, this age, that age, this approach, this building, this, we have to, they're, first and foremost, they're young people, and they're 16 and 17 year olds, and as a system, we can't approach this business by being frightened of them first. Um, you know, I, the first time I set foot on Rikers Island, I was about 21, and I also have worked at Spofford back when Spofford was the soup du jour where we put kids. And the fact is that kids are kids, and that doesn't mean, I don't mean in any way to disrespect or disregard how difficult it is to work in a facility and do what either the juvenile counselors in ACS do or the correctional officers at Rikers do, but that we have to approach this with a level of sanity that doesn't 
um, go from a place of fear, but goes from a place of these are young people who shouldn't be in a place like this, and our job is to make sure they get out of there fast and stay out of there, period. Mm-hmm. Very good. I would say that my reaction was also having um, the Department of Corrections to start and lead this um, for two years. It, it took a lot of work, a lot of effort you know, to have this uh, new law in place. It's a great opportunity. I think that one of the biggest takeaways is that there's so many good people, there's talent, there is a real opportunity at this point, and I think that we have a real urgency. Um, and I hope that we don't lose out on that opportunity. It also sounds like there's a lot of challenges, inherent ones, um, which clearly everyone is thinking through how to best address. However, I think that um, I agree, you know, starting off, you know, with the Department of Correction is probably going to slow us down, um, and there could be, you know, some serious implications, and hopefully we could avoid that. I, I echo all of those, and we just, uh, a lot of this discussion is focused on the facilities appropriately, so, um, but one thing that hasn't been mentioned a whole lot today are for the lower risk kids that are 16, 17, and to ensure that they do get those adjustment and diversion, and that there is, you know, we don't, we do, it was echoed, but the do no harm principle, um, you know, that uh, there is a lot of research that shows over servicing kids that don't need it, that can actually cause more harm, so that we, and I know probation has the juvenile philosophy within their juvenile ranks. It's just to ensure that that really is available and that that is um, emphasized with this new population. Okay. Well, thank you so much uh, for your input. We'll definitely uh, be following up. And again, I want to thank uh, the staff that have served so faithfully and diligently uh, all of this year uh, for all the hard work. I know I mentioned them at the beginning, but I want to thank them again. Uh, And with that, uh, we could lose today's hearing. Thank you so much. Thank you.